Welcome to Everyone Loves Guitar, where we get to sit down and talk with interesting professional guitar players and related music industry experts. If you love playing guitar, stick around. You're in the right place. Hi, this is Craig. Just want to let you know you can now advertise here on Everyone Loves Guitar podcast. For more information, go to everyonelovesguitar.com forward slash advertise. That's everyonelovesguitar.com forward slash advertise. Hey, everybody. This is Craig Garber with everyone from Everyone Loves Guitar. I always hate when I mess up my own introduction. Uh, we're with really a legend out of a blues legend out of Austin, Texas. We're with the one and only Denny Freeman. I'm real honored and privileged that he's joining us today. Denny's originally from Dallas. He went to college in North Texas, and then he spent a brief period of time out in LA. In 1970, he moved down to Austin, Texas, where loads of other people were mi musicians were migrating, guys like Jimmy Vaughn, Doyle Bramhall Sr., and then Stevie Ray Vaughn soon followed. And basically, you know, as Danny explained it to me, if you were music, if you were a musician at that time, or part of that subculture, or just a long hair, Austin was kind of the place to be in that part of the world at that time because it was really just a great community of young folks, very uh, hospitable, very communal, lots of pretty girls, cheap rent, eclectic, open atmosphere, very laid back, and um, it was kind of like I guess what Greenwich Village was probably like in the '60s or late '60s, early '70s. Not much different. Um, musically though, everybody pretty much had one thing in common was that they all came ready to play the blues. Denny wound up living and playing with both Jimmy and Stevie Vaughn on and off to the seventies and eighties. For some reason, um, there was a big, you know, the concentration of guys came down to play blues, but the rest of the population really had not been exposed to that for some reason locally. So there was a lot of opportunity for these guys to play. They became friends, roommates, and bandmates, and were constantly gigging. Uh, Denny played with Jimmy Vaughn's first Austin band, which was called Storm. And, he, and then he got to play on a regular basis for a couple of years with Stevie when he joined Stevie's band, The Cobras, in 1975. He also played with Austin vocalist Luann Barton and Angela Srelli. In the 80s, Denny was part of a house band at Antones backing up blues giants like Otis Rush, Albert Collins, Buddy Guy, Junior Wells, Jimmy Rogers, Eddie Taylor, Lazy Lester, and many more. How's that for a cast of people to play with, man? That's pretty cool. Primarily a guitar player, Denny's actually also a piano and organ player, and he's he's made six CDs of his own, and he's also played organ and piano on other people's records and gigs over the years, including James Cotton and Jimmy Vaughn's albums. He also toured on Jimmy Vaughn's first solo outing as the piano player. Denny wrote or co-wrote a track on Debbie Harry's No Exit album, and with Jimmy and Stevie Ray Vaughn for the Vaughn Brothers Family Style album, he had co-writes there as well. After touring for a year and a half with Jimmy in the mid-90s, he then toured with Taj Mahal and the Phantom Blues Band until late 2002. He was playing guitar then, and it was during that period of time that Taj had his Grammy-winning CD called Shouting in Key, or Shouting in Key, I should say, and Denny wound up touring the world with Taj for that album. He played in the Bob Dylan Band from 2005 till 2009, and he plays on the Bob Dylan album Modern Times and on miscellaneous tracks on other Dylan albums. In October 2011, he moved back to Austin, and he plays around town quite a, quite a bit now, and I'll tell you about some of his gigs later on. His latest album was released in October 2012, and that was called Diggin' on Dylan, which is a collection of 16 Bob Dylan songs played as instrumentals and interpreted by Denny. And in 2009, Denny was justly inducted into the Austin Music Hall of Fame. And I want to tell you also, the person who turned me on to Denny was Ian Moore, uh, whose, whose interview was really popular. If you want to go listen to that, it's episode number 285, and you can look it up on everyonelovesguitar.com. And I want to be upfront with you and tell you that and Denny would never say this, but Ian was on the scene in Austin back then, and he said Denny was a tremendous influence on the playing of both Jimmy and Stevie Ray Vaughan and on all the other players there. And I think Denny, at least in my early conversation with him last time we spoke, was probably more modest about that than he could be. So, man, with that being said, thank you so much for your time. I really appreciate you coming on the show, man. Thanks, Greg. So you lived in L.A. a couple of different times. And I was curious what prompted you to move out there and then leave the first time and come back to Austin. Well, it's a long, tedious, complicated story. I, I'll try to, it's hard to make it concise, but I'll try. 
uh, and the, everything goes so much of my life in my early life, everything, everything that happened from 1962 until 1970 was determined by the situation of the draft and how I had to respond or react to that reality because I got out of high school. I'm old. I got out of high school in 62. There was a draft and uh, nobody had heard of, well, certainly not me, had heard of Vietnam at the time, but whether I had or I, I, all I knew was I was 17 when I got out of high school, turned 18 the summer right after that. And Almost the only thing I knew at that point in my life was I liked playing guitar and I didn't want to get drafted. That's about all I knew. And the only way to avoid uh, getting drafted, I mean, if we were fighting Nazis, I hope that I would have just joined hmm. and not had to wait to be drafted. But we weren't, we didn't, we weren't fighting a war in 62 and, uh, uh, I, I wanted to stay out late and chase girls and play music. I didn't want to go to boot camp, you know, and <laughs> when I was 18 years old. But if I, but if I did those things, I would end up being, I would end up in boot camp because in 1962, that was before, that was a few years before people my age and in my situation were going, I'm not going, you know, yeah. and, and, but, but none of the alter uh, alternatives were good. None of them were, I mean, you, I didn't want to move to Canada. I mean, uh, I mean, in, in 1962, you didn't think about those things. You either went the, the one you could you could um, go to college, or there was a few things you could do to avoid the draft. And I said, well, okay, I didn't really care about college or know why I wanted to go there, but I said, well, if it's the draft or boot, I mean, if it's uh, boot camp or college, I'll just go to college. And so I went to college and, and of course you can only do that for so long and, and then your deferments start running out, you know, and, and, um, and in 1965, people were starting to hear about Vietnam and, and, and I'd already been in college just wasting a bunch of time for about three years. <clears throat> and, uh, uh, I, so I was I was getting backed up against the wall to do something. I mean, you couldn't stay in college forever and avoid the draft. And Vietnam was starting to be, enter people's consciousness if you were of age, you know. Mm. And and um, the, a lot of the college boys, the way they dealt with their military obligation, which is what it was was to join the reserves. I told yeah. you this would be long and tedious, but it, it's, it's almost impossible to... No, this is interesting. I don't think but, most people so, get to hear this. Well, so, I mean, it's, it's hard to imagine, but, you know, because it hasn't... This whole situation changed, you know, obviously several, you know, a long time ago, and there you didn't have to worry about the draft and figure out, okay, what are my options, you know, and, and none of them were really very good. None of my options was just go run off and play guitar. That wasn't, yeah. that wasn't the option. You do it for about two months and then you're go straight to boot camp. So that wasn't an option really. And so anyway, so a lot of people, not just college boys, but a lot of guys said, I'm, well, I'm going to join the reserves. They had a reserve program, which was when what you did is you joined, you joined up the Navy. I, I mean, all of the branches of the service had a reserve program. And, uh, but, but, in 65 and 66, they, they were starting to shut those reserve programs down. And uh, there was an opening at a naval air station in Dallas, just outside of Dallas. And me and my buddy said, we heard that they had two openings. And we were thinking, well, we better, I, I don't know, maybe we ought to grab them while they're still there. And so we went down and joined the Navy Air Reserves because uh, the reserve programs were getting ready to be shut down. And and, and, and what you had to do was you, you had to do six months of boot camp, one weekend every month, and then two weeks every summer for a total, the total enlistment was six years. So you might only have to do six months of active duty, but you had five and a half years of, of weekends and two mm. weeks in the summer. And that was a, that was a horrible and that's what I chose. And, and, um, and anyway, so 
that, that's just setting everything up that, that followed. So in 66, I felt really backed up against the wall. So me and my buddy, we joined up and, uh, and, and we went and did our boot camp in 66. And, uh, and after that, I thought, well, I have already been in college this long. I might as well get a degree, I guess, a worthless degree. But I thought, well, I might as well do that. And so now I was, now I was free to play guitar and not get drafted, but I had reserve meetings every month and, and two weeks every summer, which, which really killed a big groove back then. You know, you couldn't grow your hair long. You couldn't go on tours. You could, it was, a, it was, a, if, if you, if you were married and had a job and worked at a, a white collar job or something like that, then it was a good, it was a good option, you know, to, uh, one weekend a month was no big deal. And two weeks of summer wasn't that big a deal. My first two week summer cruise was uh, in Sp- in uh, Hawaii, and the second one was in Spain. So, so uh, if, if you just had a regular job, that that was a good option. But for me, it was a terrible option, you know, because uh, it was just a terrible option. I mean, but none of the options were good. But anyway, anyway I finally got out of school and just, I got a degree. It was a worthless degree, and. Uh, and, but in so this was that was in '68 because I had to lose a couple of semesters to go do the active duty and and when I got out of school this was '68 and and Dallas was uh, I mean by then I'd started smoking pot and and the whole world had changed you know uh, it had the w- whole the world was especially if you were my age the world was a lot different in 67 and 68 than it was in 64 wow. even 65 wow i mean it was it was i mean because like in i mean it's it's hard to imagine the difference because yeah, like in, is. because in 65 and 66 that's when people were I mean, unless you were some uh, unless you lived in the village or, or San Francisco or something like that most people weren't growing their hair long and and if you grew your hair long i mean that to me it, it sounds silly to even talk about it now because now it means absolutely nothing it, <laughs> yeah. means, it means nothing yeah but back then in 1968 and 67 if by then people had started smoking marijuana and taking acid and, and and stuff like that and and but and that was a radical thing to do because like in 64 65 marijuana was still dope so it was like 50s culture still in the mid early it, to it, mid 60s it, it, and then all it, of a sudden no, it was. switch flip it was it was wow. like i started smoking pot in 67 and it was a radical thing to do some, some people turned me on and and uh, uh, i mean i was even a little bit late to smoke to start smoking pot in 67 really yeah. but 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 the, it was so it was such a radical thing to do. It's hard to imagine, but it's like because a lot of people considered that dope, you know, and, and nobody wanted to take dope, <laughs> you know, you, you know, and 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 people, if you tr- if somebody if if somebody got turned on, we call it, you know, if, yeah. if you were turned on and you wanted to turn on your friend. You had to make sure that that friend wasn't going to freak out if you said, "Hey, try this." Yeah, yeah. You know. And 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 um it was a real risky thing and then I tell you what, I don't ever want to be more stoned than I got on that $10 Mexican pot in 1967. <laughs> I don't know how good it was and and there was just <laughs> the part of it was the the paranoia and stuff. But but when I finally got stoned, on that ten dollar Mexican pot, drive, we'd drive from Denton to Dallas to get a five dollar matchbox of Mexican pot, uh-huh. and I don't ever want to be more stoned than I got on that stuff. That was pretty and, big high. And, well, yeah, I mean, it might, I'm sure that it wasn't anywhere near as strong as what is on the street today, you yeah. know. But it was such such it was such a bit. You can't imagine what a big deal it was to smoke pot and get high. It was such it was so foreign to every everything. And if you were and you just kind of had to find some safe place to smoke it and, and and we would get together and go over to somebody's apartment or ride around in somebody's car and smoke pot and listen to music. And if, 
if you if you were if you were at somebody's I mean candles and stuff you know and yeah. incense and and smoking pot and listening to Crosby I mean, Stills Nash I, and Young or something well I I well and before that you know I mean I did actually that's funny because I. I didn't really quite understand why everybody liked them. I'm not putting them down. That just didn't. That wasn't whatever, your that, thing. That doesn't. No, that doesn't matter. I mean, I listened to. I did listen to Buffalo Springfield, which sure. is same cats. I mean, to some degree and stuff. But whatever, whatever, you know. But who were you listening to back then when you'd sit there, but, like, and and you and your buddies when you first started well, getting I was, high? Well, when all this stuff started happening, once the Beatles started smoking pot and making some groundbreaking records i i was of the age hmm. you know and and so i was interested in i i didn't like everything but i i i would still listen to muddy waters and hmm. jimmy reed but 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 i was i was i was of the age of this generation that was where all of this stuff was this revolutionary stuff and everything culture sexual stuff uh, for sexual freedom for girls and it was an exciting time. I mean, but Vietnam and the draft and war and all this horrible stuff was mixed up right. I mean, well, that was even probably what a lot of it was about, but it's, it's just hard to imagine the chaos and the revolutionary things and the things that were so radical then that are just passe now, you know, and, yeah. and, uh, 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 I mean, it's like if you were, sometimes you would just get together with you would okay y'all want to get high tonight so you'd find some place to go smoke pot or at somebody's house it was like a, that was that was a big deal to go <laughs> smoke pot somewhere i mean that was what and 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 if you're sitting there lighting up and smoking and all of a sudden you heard it you was like oh crap, oh, crap. <laughs> like because you, uh, I mean, you immediately <laughs> thought it was the police are are just as bad. It would be a friend of yours that didn't smoke pot. Oh yeah, yeah, yeah. And then you'd be the, you know, now you'd have all I this mean, you know, moral and ethical well, le- I mean, and just legal. A real yeah, yeah. yeah, I mean, it was it was. It's hard to imagine now how what a big deal it was to smoke marijuana. It was a big deal because whenever when all of this was start getting going not everybody smoked and certainly not everybody smoked at the same time and not everybody liked it or was interested and some people were straight and some people weren't straight you know it, and and so you you had to it took a while to sort out who you could trust not by not because they were bad people or dishonest but who, uh, yeah. who would freak out at the thought of being around some marijuana or something, you know, and, and then of course that led to LSD. I don't care what they say. And then that was even crazier, you know? And, (laughs) and so it was just, it was just a crazy, crazy time. And, and, um, and, and it sounds really silly to talk about it, but, but it's like, um, those of us that smoke pot and, and were, were getting caught up in this, all of this new stuff. I mean, the Beatles changed so much with, their once they started smoking pot and the word got around and their music started changing from just some of the sappy pop stuff that rock and roll had devolved into you know everything fashion changed uh, the the sexual revolution uh, marijuana uh, just it, it's it's a, it's really sorry it's sorry it's 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 hard to imagine now the kind of radical changes that were going on and and I mean, I'm old enough to where in the uh, I'm old enough to where like uh, the first time I ever got the, the first time music ever really made an impact on me. I, I was like barely 12 years old, maybe 11 years old. Cause, what, cause, what was it? What was that? that well, bef- well, the, the thing is, is before that, there was no there was no rock and roll that white kids were hearing right. but just as i was becoming an adolescent just as i was becoming an adolescent uh that's when little richard that's domino chuck berry buddy holly uh, elvis all of the, uh, there was nothing and then all of a sudden there was all of that stuff it seems like almost at once i while i was waiting to do this interview, I was, I was just checking some dates and I went back and I was looking at the top hundred songs for the, for the years of 54, 55 and 56, you know, and, 
And uh, in 54, in 54, I would have been 10. I was born in 44. And, and in 10, I, I didn't really think about music, really. But when I was about 11, I started – my next-door neighbor, this, this girl that was a year older than me, she used to drag me to these parties on Friday nights. And, and I didn't even want to go and dance with chicks and stuff and play spin the bottle and stuff. I didn't really want to do that, but she made me go. And and so it was in somebody's converted garage, you know, and they had the <clears throat> record player that played 45s and the Cokes and the parents stayed in another part of the house. And we would dance and play games and eat and all that stuff. And and it was kind of fun. And then and then we started dancing. My girl said, dance with me, you know, and so, okay, I don't know how to she just dance with me. And so, and so they would play these, which was like, I'm ta- this, this would have been like 55 or something like that. And so they were playing some doo-wop stuff. And there was some of the kids that were older than me were hearing some doo-wop stuff and some black music that, th- that wasn't really uh, pervasive on the radio quite yet, but the kids had heard some of the, so anyway, so the point is, is I would dance with these, with, with this girl to do wop stuff, slow dancing to do wop stuff. And it's the first time I'd ever held a girl that close, you know, or held one period. And, and I was going, well, maybe girls aren't so icky after all. <laughs> you know. And uh, I associated that with doo-wop, you know, Earth Angel or whatever, yeah, or yeah. whatever. I mean, I'm t- we're talking late 50s, and I, I was going. So I, I was just becoming an adolescent when, and then, and then uh, I was looking at these uh, lists, and Maybelline came out in 55. Oh, I, was, and, I didn't realize and, it was that and, early. And and it was right. It was though. And Fats Domino and a couple of people, Ray Charles, were. I was looking at these charts of a of a. I don't know what 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 it, what list it was exactly but in the top 100 songs of 54 well uh Maybelline had Chuck Chuck wasn't there yet but there was a couple of doo-wop things and maybe Ray Charles and actually maybe even Bill Haley and the Comets were hmm. starting to starting to kind of creep onto the charts but then I looked at the one for 55 with uh and now all of a sudden now we're getting some Chuck and 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 maybe out of a hundred songs, there might have been seven or eight that were kind of early rock and roll or what passed for rock and roll or just some R- old R and B, New Orleans stuff that mm. was because that was early R and B was considered rock and roll. You know, it just yeah. it just hadn't been called rock and roll yet. And then you look at the top a hundred songs for fifty six, and it's like holy crap, where did all? I mean, it's just like the the just from nothing practically and i was i was 12 and 56 and and actually i i i'm trying to remember like in when i was in the 6th grade i don't really have any memories of music in the 6th grade but maybe that's when i started going to those parties but i think it was the summer in between the sixth grade and the seventh grade when i started what we call junior high school hmm. you know, i turned 12 and this is in Dallas. Yeah, in Dallas, yeah. yeah. And and uh, so now on KLIF, the top 40 radio station, now all of a sudden I'm hearing ba 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 I'm hearing Little Richard's crazy screaming guy, and, and, and Elvis was starting to make the – was starting to get big by 56, and Fats Domino and a Little Richard, you know, and Chuck Berry and all of this. It was it was astounding how and Bo Diddley you know just all of this I mean all of these people were charting Bo Diddley was on the charts, uh, Muddy Waters was on the charts. Eventually Jimmy Reed and John Lee Hooker were on the charts, and and um, and and so just as I was becoming an adolescent, this that's when this music uh, appeared, kind of almost out of nowhere, and it and it I just kind of hadn't quite got over it yet, you know, and. Uh, and and this this actually is still a part of your answer to why sixty why did I go to California I guess because I mean well now I don't even remember but but um, that that's just everything kind of goes back to that for me uh, and then like hearing that music for the first time that was the first thing that kind of 
set me on this trip I'm on. And the second thing that set me on this trip I'm on was the was the the mil, the military obligation situation that that I encountered when I got out of high school later on in '62. So I so anyway so I finished school and and by this time Dallas was like a not a it wasn't a if you smoke pot and you had long hair Dallas was not one of the better places to be. It it's was, a it was real conservative. Yeah, yeah. and uh, uh, which was which, which most of the country was. Yeah, and th- these days, I mean, I understand now, and it, you know, I, it's like I don't, I'm not the same person. I, nothing's the same as it was then. But but the fact was, we had long hair, we smoked pot, and I wasn't a hippie, but I looked like a hippie to a cop and a redneck, you know. <laughs> and uh, and uh, that's great. And, <laughs> and I thought, well, California is where it's at. It's either California, oh, okay, California, or New York City. So. In 1968, when I got out of school, I worked at the freight docks for a couple of just, I mean, truck freight docks sure. like in, in Dallas and saved up about $300 or something and got in a 61 Chevrolet and drove to California. And I was headed for San Francisco because that was one of the main centers of all of this stuff. Hmm. But by 68, by late 68, I don't know. It was still it was still kind of happening, but and I wasn't a hippie hippie, but I had friends there, and and it just seemed like such a hipper place to Dallas at the time. Yeah. But I, but I but I stopped off in Los Angeles to to see some friends, and I had car trouble, and I ended up getting stuck in Los Angeles for about six months. And the only reason I really came back to Texas, I, and when I returned, when I came back to Texas, I went back to Dallas because my my sister got married. And right. I came back for her wedding, and I was going to go back to Los Angeles, but by now I'm in trouble with the military because I hadn't been to a reserve meeting in about a year, oh, and you can't, shit, yeah. and, and you can't do that. Yeah. And I was in trouble, and uh, I was trying to figure out a way out of that dilemma, and 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 I just decided, well, I might as well deal with this dilemma in Dallas before I go back because it's no fun being out there being a fugitive and, and not, I still can't play. Yeah. Yeah. And, and, and and I happened and I didn't really know Jimmy, but I ran into him a couple of times and he told me about this, uh, psychiatrist that was sympathetic to people like me that had a issue with the military. And by now this is 68, 69 and Vietnam was a, big deal oh, you know? yeah. and, there, and, and there was a lot of chaos about it and it wasn't a black and white issue you know and and uh i didn't really but but now i was in the military you know and and all this vietnam stuff was going on and it was a it was a dilemma for me but i decided i've got to deal with this before i go back to california and and so while i was sticking around dallas trying to deal with uh with that, some friends of mine said, "Hey, let's you know, let's go to Austin this weekend." I had some friends that were were familiar with Austin. I'd never been to Austin. One, so, let me ask yeah. you one interrupt one second. When you were in L.A., had, were you playing at the time? Is that no, what you were doing? No, no, you I weren't. Was, I was I was struggling to pay the rent. I lived in a, I stayed in about six places in about five months out there, and it was it was a real it was a and, then, and my car broke down out there. And, uh, no car in L.A. is not a good situation. Oh, hell yeah. So you were just trying to like figure shit out as a I young kid out there. Out, figure yeah. out, survive, and 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 then I'd got myself and I quit as as soon as I went out there. I had to transfer to a reserve base out there, which is you can do that, and I did. But I I just by then I was taking LSD, and I just said I just can't do this anymore. And I never went back to another reserve meeting, and mm. you can't do that. Yeah. So. So now I'm in Los Angeles without a car and in trouble with the military yeah. and, and broke and struggling and parking cars and doing all just hustling. And I come back from my sister's wedding, long story short, well, long story, not as long. I, I, while I'm in Dallas waiting to go back to Los Angeles, I come down to Austin with some friends of mine for the weekend to hang out. And I think we actually came down on mescaline in a Volkswagen bus. <laughs> yeah. How how period classic is that? Well, it, it was. It was. <laughs> I mean, and those people weren't really hippies either. I didn't really. I mean, I'm not putting down hippies. It's just that we were musicians that had long hair and yeah. smoked pot and everything, but we weren't political hippies or cultural. Yeah, hippies. yeah, I totally we get were, it. We were we were musicians. 
I mean, to cops and rednecks, we look like. You look like the like the guys marching down the streets yeah, about right. against Vietnam, yeah. Right. But anyway, so, and the very first day I came to Austin, I went, holy crap, this is, I mean, you, I could just tell the vibe and the way it looked. And one day I said, I don't need to go back to California. This is this is all I could ever need, or at least for for the time. Mm. It was a small, it was a small college town. It was, it was the capital. It was a, uh, and in those days, in the late '60s, the the, the the campuses is where everything emanated from. Mostly, I mean, you know, culturally, yeah. I, there were musical centers in San Francisco and L.A. and New York, obviously, but the, a lot of the stuff that was going on in the country was emanating from the campuses and I, I wasn't a student anymore but but Austin was it was a small town small college town the capital so it wasn't a it wasn't a rough and tumble blue collar thing or you know it was just a nice little cheap college town with a whole bunch of pretty girls and a whole bunch of long-haired people and some music going on and and it just seemed like a so much an easier place to survive in than Dallas in Los Angeles and in Austin, th- there was a community of long haired people here and, and there was more of them in a smaller place. And, and they, I could tell they had their thing going on down here. They had had their, their, their little community and their whole thing. They, they survived quite nicely in this little long haired community. And, and so, uh, I said, well, I'm just going to go down there. And, and it, it took me a, nearly a year to actually move down to, to down here to Austin. Uh, and and then I was here for 20 years and I had to leave. To, that's another story. But but uh, I went to I went to, to was that University of Texas at Austin? Is that what was down there? What was the college there? Yeah. 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 UT. UT right. Austin. Yeah. OK. Right. And uh, right. So the first time I came to Austin, I mean, to Los Angeles, I would I didn't even intend to go to Los Angeles. I was trying to go to. San Francisco, San Francisco. Yeah. and and I was hoping to play or get my stuff straightened out up there, but I ended up in L.A. with car trouble, got stuck there, and and I don't think I played a gig the whole time I was there. I had a guitar and an amp with me, and I would, but I but I was I was trying to pay the rent and struggle, and and then I got in trouble with the military, so my whole six months out there was was just was was just a struggle every day, you know, and and. Uh, Anyway, it was it, those were those were exciting times, but for me, they were really very difficult times. Yeah, and, and it I ended like- up I ended up moving to Austin in 1970, and I still hadn't. Re- and by this time, I hadn't been to a reserve meeting in I don't know two years or something. And you can't do that. And Holy I still, shit! <laughs> I was still kind of one step ahead of them in the because I was moving around, and they since I was a reservist they weren't that familiar with me personally. And so just the red tape and the bureaucracy, I was one step ahead of them, but they were on my heels, you know, but I was, I managed to not end up in Leavenworth somehow. And, but, uh, I moved down to Austin in 1970 and all of that wasn't resolved. It finally got resolved. But anyway, so I moved down here to Austin and for the first time in my life, I felt free. I felt freedom. I felt even though, even though the military thing wasn't resolved i said i'm here i i'm i'm for the first time i'm a musician now i'm a musician i don't care i'm not going to school i'm 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 living in austin texas and i'm gonna play and if and if they want me they're just gonna have to come get me and haul me off to prison or something but but so in other words my whole life from 1962 when i got out of high school until 1970 was it was just a big horrible mess because of the way I dealt with the yeah. military. Looking back on it, the looking back on it, the 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 easiest thing to have done would have just been get drafted. You know, two years later, I would be done with everything. If you, you know, came, I, if you came back. Well, well right, but in '62 there wasn't any Vietnam anyway. Oh, there know, wasn't or, there wasn't armed conflict. Not in '62. Okay. I might have drunk too much in Germany or something, you know, but <laughs> that was, but in 62 and 63 and 64, I don't, you know, there, it wasn't really all that dangerous out there. Not really. I mean, the cold war was going on, but, but anyway, sorry, that was just, a, it, it's just hard. It's hard to talk about. No, that's a great, st- thank you, man. You know, sorry. That's a great friggin' story. 
I mean, it's that was. I have a couple of questions that came of that though. Uh, the first one is, in your opinion, going from you know seeing this and being a part of it and in it, what was the good and the bad of all of these changes? If, if that's even a question, maybe that's no. A- it is. It's a no. It's a. It's right. And uh, I think the for me. Well, uh, maybe the most painful one was the divide that that it caused be- between us and our parents. It makes me really sad to think about it. You know, I'm, I'm first of all, thank you. But I, I, my second question is directly tied to that, and it might be the answer. It, you were alone out there, and I've been in that situation. It's just trying to figure shit out. You're in your 20s. You're fucking alone. You don't have any answers. And I didn't have anybody to ask, so it was a miserable period. And I was curious, did you like think of like calling home or asking them for help? or like? Because like, you know, I have three kids now, and you know, they pick up the phone all the time, you know, anything, which is I'm glad. I'm, I'm grateful for that. And uh, I couldn't do that. And I was curious. I, I I sensed the loneliness that you felt out there. And I've been there, man. And it fucking sucks. It's really. Well, yeah, know. well, it was, it was, it was, uh, it was, it was, it was a, a real drag on a lot of levels because like I didn't really get along with my dad very good. I, I, when I was a child, I had a great childhood, a great childhood. Uh, totally stable. My, I never saw my parents even argue. They didn't drink. Nobody went to jail. <clears throat> Take your time, man. And uh, my parents are, are, you know, they. my dad was born in I guess uh, 1913 or something. Her mother was born a few years later and they went through, well, he didn't go through world war one. I. I mean, he was a child, but they, they went through the thirties and world war two and the great depression, everything. Yeah. And, and, and uh, I was, I, I wasn't the first person in my family. My dad had a big family. I wasn't the first person to go to college, but I, by the time I got out of high school, even people like my family, I mean, we weren't poor, but we didn't really have any money. Mm. And, but I didn't know that because I always had a new football and some new shoes and anything I wanted. I, I didn't know we didn't have any money. Mm. But, <clears throat> but, but when I got out of high school, it, it seemed to me like it was, it was, um, maybe for the first time it was almost expected well you got out of high school well, go to you're going to college then you know it's like it wasn't always that way hmm. but North Texas when I went to North Texas in 1962 I, I think I, I, I might be wrong but I don't think I am I think tuition was $75 a semester wow you know and I was paying $30 a month rent you know and one place I lived upstairs in this little old lady's house, I paid $15 a month for rent. Wasn't worth much more than that. But I mean, you know, it's like <laughs> it, it, everything was so, I mean, I could go to school. Yeah. And, and, and I squandered it. And, and not only did I, my, as a child, I didn't have any real problem with my parents. My dad was, he was always mad at me because I wanted to sleep late, you know, and I didn't want to go pull weeds and I didn't want to do chores and do all. And, you know, and I was, I was a good kid, but I still was always in trouble about something, you know, but he was just trying to make sure that I didn't turn out to be a bum or something, you know? Sure. And, but it wasn't a big deal, but, but like once I got out of high school and the more I, he, he never was comfortable with me playing music, really. I mean, but he, we didn't even really, we weren't that close. We didn't talk about stuff, but we didn't really have any real conflicts until later on when people started having long hair and he started 
and then he was wondering what the hell's he up to, you know, and, and, and he was, he was on my case a lot and it, and he kind of didn't like me very much. He was disappointed and, and I didn't like him. And, and, uh, it was a mother was caught in the middle and it was a, it was a, it was terrible. And, um, uh, it wasn't until, uh, later on that, 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 uh, uh, back in the, I don't know if it was in the eighties or the, whenever it was like he, my dad and I, we had, it was bad. And, and my friends knew how bad it was. I had it worse with him than a lot of people. And, and one, one time, one day, a, a friend of mine that was a few years older than me was over at my house. And we were talking about this stuff. I was talking about my dad and the latest outrage, you know, and, and I thought my friend was going to say, yeah, what a jerk he is. And my, my friend said to me, he said, then you need to get that shit straight. And I went, huh? And he said, you need to, you need to <clears throat> deal with that. He said, you don't want him to, to die with you, with, with you hating him and stuff. And, uh, uh, I thought about it and it took me a while, I guess, to realize. And then I, and then at some point I started thinking, well, you know what? I don't really, I don't know. He, he's kind of disappointing to me too, you know, and he's kind of, he ain't cool. He's not educated and sophisticated and he doesn't like my music or my friends or what I'm trying to do. But then I was thinking, you know what? <clears throat> so <clears throat> sorry. No, man, you don't have to apologize for a thing. <clears throat> Take your time. <clears throat> he and mother go through all that stuff that they went through. And then they get this kid. This is, well, yeah, thanks a lot, but I reject all that. I'm going to go, uh, you know, I don't want to be in the Navy. I don't want to, I'm growing my hair long and I didn't cop to smoking dope, but they, they would see, they would see people on TV that looked like me and was going, oh my God, you know, and, and, <clears throat> and it, it took me a, a long time to, Think, well, golly, you know, this must be really, even though they don't really under, the point was, is like, I realized that there was no way for them. Mother didn't really, she just was sad about it. But, <clears throat> and, and that really hurt me that I was inadvertently making her sad. But I realized that there was no way that, my dad especially could understand who I was, what I would wanted to do and what I was trying to do and how I was trying to do it. There was no way he could understand that to him. I was just some damn worthless beatnik or something, you know, that he mm -hmm. didn't, he wasn't hip to nothing. And here, and he, he wanted me to get a job at Sears or something, you know, or, sure. or, what, or whatever, you know, he didn't want me to, because he, he didn't want me to be a bum. I don't think he would have objected to me being in music if I'd have been a success right out of the gate, you know, and made money or something. But That's not I, realistic, I, though. No, right. Well, right. right. And, he, and, and there's no way he would understand that. No way to understand that. And, and I'm only, it took him a while to realize that I was serious about this stuff, you know. And the more he realized I was serious about this stuff, that's when it started getting bad and it, it was just bad for a long time. And, and, uh, I, 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 I mean, I didn't think I was doing the wrong thing really by what I was doing, even though I, I made some mistakes and some of the things he might've accused me of were true. Uh, yeah. I, I, I did like to stay out late, you know, and not get up early and go to a, a job I didn't want to go to. I did want to go play the guitar with my pals and do all that, you know, but he didn't understand that that was, I was serious about that and it was important, you know, and he didn't understand that. And I, and it took me a while to realize <clears throat> how it was, 
that I could under, I could understand where they were coming from about a hundred times easier than they could understand where I was coming from. Sure. So if we were going to work this out, I was going to have to give like 80, it was going to be like yeah. 80, 80, 20. And I said, okay, okay, okay. All right. Okay. It's okay. And, and eventually I started doing things that made him, made it appear that I was having some kind of success. I mean, a lot of things he didn't recognize, but, but at some point, you know, early on, I don't know, it took a while. I mean, I mean, certain recordings that I was on, it took me a long time to get on any recordings or do anything that, that he could actually look at and go, okay. You know, it, it, it took a while for something like that to happen, like being on Austin City Limits or going to New York or going to Europe or, or, or something. He wasn't, he was hard to impress with all that, all that stuff. But, but I guess at some point, we kind of smoothed it out a little bit and probably partly because I just said, okay, okay. You know, and I started feeling bad for them and I felt bad for that whole, uh, I mean, even, even back when, when all this stuff was going on and people were getting radicalized and all this stuff was going on on the campus, people, people now don't, I mean, I was there, I wasn't, I wasn't political, but I knew what was going on and, <clears throat> and, and I wasn't straight. I was smoking pot and I was a musician. So I was, I wasn't any kind of radical or I wasn't a, really a bad boy or, or anything like that, really. Sure. But I was just trying to play music. And, and uh, when you play music, you associate with a different kind of people that uh, it's a different kind of. Pe- I mean, I love them. I've always. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I, I mean, I, the people that I have known in, in my life, I, they're the, I, I love them. I respect them and everything. But but it's still the subculture compared to the daytime. Yeah. The guys wearing shirt and ties to work <laughs> or, or the blue collar guys or something. Yeah, the guys right, just right. work their ass off. You know, it, it, I, I did some stuff that a lot of those people didn't do and it wasn't like horrible or evil really, but it was, it was, it was, and I found myself questioning. I mean, whenever I, the first time I smoked pot, I went, well, I guess I'm taking dope now, you know, I mean, and that was, to me, that was a, that was yeah. a big deal. But then I realized, well, but this is misunderstood and, and it's not really the, you know, uh, like those old movies from the twenties and thirties about it. What, you know, what, um, it wasn't, it wasn't, it wasn't the way it was portrayed really, you know, and some of the people that were involved in that culture weren't all monsters and bomb throwing radicals and stuff. But I, I found myself as I was going I don't know. I can't relate to a lot of those people either. I mean, not not just real radicals, but a lot of the hippie stuff. I thought, I don't know about some of that stuff, you know, and some of the and I was thinking, don't they do they not even care that their parents are getting hurt and sacrificed all this stuff? And they just reject it. You know, it's like it's like a lot of people my generation just appeared to flat out reject everything they believed in and gave their damn whole whole damn lives for. We just said, nah, that's worthless. I mean, that, what a painful, I mean, they, their generation wasn't perfect. They, there was, there was a lot of issues that needed were way overdue being dealt with. There's yeah. no question about that. But a lot of people in my generation threw the baby out with the bathwater. I mean, mm. it's just, it was, we, we lost a lot of good stuff in all of this revolutionary stuff that was going on. So the personal part to me was just the, I mean, even though I didn't ever really wasn't that close to my dad anyway, it was, there was, there was several years there where it was, it was just bad. And I felt bad just because I heard him, even, even if I didn't like him or dis- disagreed with him, I felt bad that what I was doing was hurting him because I didn't want to. You sure. Know, but, you have, you have kids yourself. I've never been married and don't have kids. So let me tell you something that would make you feel better. I have three kids. They're 28, 26, and 18. And it, I've learned I cannot tell anybody what to do. So some of this is on your dad, to be honest with you, just to, if it makes you feel any better. Because especially once a kid's 18, you have no right legally or otherwise you can guide them and suggest but it's their life man 
You know? Yeah, well, he he wasn't he wasn't able to. to I know what you're saying. I, I appreciate it. But he he wasn't able to see it because, to, you know, when I was 18, I I was an idiot. You but know? who who's not? <laughs> well, well, no, he forgot about stuff like that. Right, know? but that's what I'm he, saying. Don't don't take all of this on your shoulders, yeah, man. No, I, I I don't because and I don't really feel bad about what I was doing. I just am sorry that it hurt him so much. You know? Yeah, but we all do the best we can, you know. I mean, he yeah. was doing the best he can. You were doing the best he can. He 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 did. You know, he did. He did the. I mean, I looking back on everything, he he was still a good man. I can't. I was lucky to grow up how I grew up. I mean, at least until I was 18, I was lucky. Yeah. I I was lucky. Totally stable situation at home, at school, the neighborhood. My whole damn life was Mm. safe and warm and fuzzy. Yeah, yeah. But, um, wow, man, thank you for sharing that. But, yeah, you you don't need to carry all that, man. Just It's just everybody's trying to figure out their thing. But once that – you have no right, and I've learned that because I've got three kids, and it became easier with each successive kid, even though the level of frustration that each one gave me seemed to be <laughs> increasingly difficult. You know, I'm like, hey, man, I'm here if you need me. And I would just sit, and my wife and I would talk to each other, but we know we have no right to, to, well, no, it I, is I what it is, that man. And, you're, and, and that's a, that's a, the wiser way to do it. You know, but but I what, I what choice? Why my dad couldn't do it. Yeah, what's my choice? Well, well he, I mean, it only made things worse for him. <laughs> right, and and I and I and on the and as you get older, you know, you want to minimize if you're smart enough. And somehow I'm a little bit smart. I, I'm, I've realized shit. I want to minimize the stress in my life. You know. Oh man. <laughs> well, the fu- the funny thing is, is like uh, I I love kids. I, I love them. I've got. I when I was younger and had. Uh, young girlfriends that had young kids. Mm. Now they're 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 totally grown now. Yeah, I mean, what you know, they're in their forties. There's a couple of girls, little children that I knew when they were babies, and they're my good friends, and I love them to death. That's great, and I'm still man. in still in touch with them, and there would be more, except some of them just moved off. But but like I love kids, and my girlfriend is a new grandmother. She's got a baby, a grandbaby, not, uh, not quite two years old. And I love her so much. I almost can't stand it. That's great, man. That's great. And then Kathy Valentine was my girlfriend when I was in LA and, and, uh, uh, you know, do you know that name? I don't, I'm sorry. Oh, the go-go's. Oh, okay. Yeah. Okay. Sure. And, uh, anyway, I got to know her out there and, 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 she wanted to have, she was younger than me. She's 15 years younger than me. And we hooked up and she pretty much knew how I, I didn't want to get married. I didn't want to have kids, but we hooked up anyway. And, and then one day she said, uh, we got to talk. I went, Oh God, those are, those are the words. No guy ever wants to <laughs> <Yeah. hear. laughs> we got to talk. Oh yeah. crap. Well, I got to go. <laughs> but, and what she said was, look, I want a family. I want a baby. I went, uh Oh, well, I wish you all the luck in the world, but I got to go, you know, and, and we broke up, I mean, amicably and we're, and, yeah. and she ended up and and getting married and having a kid pretty soon after that. And to my surprise, I've totally freaked out over that little baby. And, 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 and then I moved back to Texas when that little baby was two years old and, and I almost couldn't stand it. I would book gigs in Los Angeles really as an excuse just to go see her little baby. Wow. And, uh, and then, and then when, fortunately for me, when she were, when they, when she was four, Kathy and the, her new family moved to Austin. So, but now she's, but now she's 15 and I lost her years ago, Mm. you know, just as a playmate, you know, but, but we're still friends, but I, I'm just saying I, I, but I can't imagine, I don't know. I've got some out there on my deck. I've got some cacti. But that's about the. <laughs> <laughs> They're a lot easier than kids. <laughs> that's, that's 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 about that's about all I think I could handle. I mean, I'd be a good dad, I think, but but I just it just never occurred to me to get married. I, I mean, it's hard enough to be a musician, and I was going well. Put, I mean, aside from that, I just never really cared about getting married, and I love. Ki- I mean, I do love kids. I I, I I get along with them. I like them, but I. The thought of having one, 
like Uh-oh. like Do- like Doyle too told me one day said when he got his first one he said you got to feed them every day. <laughs> It's true. It's one of the toughest, if not the toughest thing I've had. No, I can't. I mean, I can't. I I just can't even. I can't even imagine. And this little grandbaby's not my baby, but I worry about her. I mean, I try not to worry myself sick about her, but she's just such a fragile, beautiful little little thing. And to think about her out in this world, I go, oh crap. Yeah. And And then imagine they're eighteen, and you can't say a damn thing. No, God. Oh God. And you talk about worry. Oh shit! If I had a girl. My daughter's 18 Man. and it's like, oh God, she leaves the house at night. My, and- deep, my deepest sympathies. <laughs> it's tough, man. And you know, so, uh, but man, thank you very much for sharing all that. That was uh, well, really I, cool. I'm, I appreciate it. It's hard. It's, I, I wish I didn't. I mean, if we're going to talk about what I, I mean, it's almost impossible for me to talk about stuff without talking about that to, because it, it just explains so much to me in my mind. Yeah. It's, it's hard to not talk about it. And I wish it didn't, takes so long but it's such a such a path that goes every different damn direction but yeah yeah no you didn't it, but it all, cool, all of that led to austin i guess you know and and then my, that's when my life such as it is lost it, it's 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 uh, disorder and chaos i mean com- relatively speaking sure <laughs> i mean that was when i got to austin i like i say i still was in trouble with the military but i just said okay that's your problem and i just went ahead with my life for the first time as though that wasn't a problem and jimmy moved down jimmy and doyle moved down here a month after i moved down here and we were playing a week after that and so i was for the first you know it took me it was only eight years but from 62 to 68 it seemed like a long time it was tough Eight, eight years alone with problems is a long time well, being totally frustrated and having no money, I mean, I, and it, it's that's a lot of shit. And being in, you know, but and it, it, all I wanted to do was play, really. And yeah. it took me eight years, and I still with that the military. For all I knew, they were going to come pick me up. Then did the know? psychologist get you out of it? The shrink, mm, kind of. Uh, like how did it go away so, in the end or they just like didn't ever well uh, he he. it's not like he was just going to write a letter and lie to, about, about a bunch of stuff and send him a letter but the thing was you, you mean like that, they do today <laughs> uh, right. just as long but, as but he, as long as you come back for your meds every but, month <laughs> but I, I had a I had a friend it was in the Navy Reserves and, and his parents sent him to a, he, he wasn't crazy as far as I knew but it's his parents sent him to a shrink back then. And when the Navy found out that he was seeing a shrink, they said, "Uh Oh, okay. Don't call us. We'll call you. Oh, wow. And and so I thought, okay, there's my angle, you know? And I eventually tried that. And I went to see this guy and he was, I said, I heard about you. And he, I mean, I didn't say it like that, but (laughs) it was the guy, Jimmy knew about him. I don't know if Jimmy used him or not, but, but so I went to see him and, and he didn't like me and I didn't like him, but he was acting like, I ain't just going to lie. I ain't going to just write a bunch of lies so you can get out. Yeah. You got to pay well, me for why, a few why? months. <laughs> yeah, well, right. Well, I mean, which, which was, which would have been fine, but I was, I didn't really understand anything, but the point was now I could say, okay, I've been to a shrink. I mean, that that's kind of all I needed to, yeah. you know, the fact that, I, but, but that didn't really quite work yet, but it, Actually, to tell the truth, eventually, right after I moved to Austin, uh, I don't think we had a phone, but somewhere I got a message that my mother, I got a letter or something. Somehow I got a phone call and my, and my mother said, uh, the Department of the Navy is trying to reach you. And I went, oh, great. So I called up this number and they said, show up at the federal building next week at such and such a time and day. And I went, well, I don't live. I've just moved to Austin. They said, well, we got a federal building down there. (laughs) So they made an appointment. And so I leave the house and I tell my roommates, I go, well, maybe I'll see you later and maybe I won't. (laughs) So I drive to the federal building and there's a 
Department of the Navy guys say, well, we just need to talk to you. And uh, on they, I had been called back to the base specifically after I'd quit going to meetings. And if they call me back, I wasn't going to not go. I didn't yeah. go to the meetings, but if they sent me a summons, I would go. And one or one or two of them was for a, a physical. And I went. And for the first time when it said, have you taken drugs? Have you done this? I started going, heck yeah. You know, <laughs> and, uh, and so what, and so the interview really was about these guys were going, we just need to talk to you about your, this, this drug use on your, uh, on your, these last forms you filled out. And, and so they, they were real nice. They just, matter of fact, asked me about my drug usage and, and other stuff, I guess, you know, and, and then when it was all over, they read back the statement said, is this true? Does this sound truthful to you? Does, is this a, what you, what does this sound like what, what our interview revealed? And I said, yeah. And they said, well, sign here. And so I did. And they said, now what? And they said, well, you can go. That's up to the Navy what they're going to do with you. And, and a couple of years later, they sent me my discharge papers and it was um, a general discharge. And I just looked at it the other day and it was, it was a, I don't know, it might have some medical or I don't know. I think there might've been some reference to drug use or something. I don't, I don't know, but it, it wasn't dishonorable. But then it was but over. The, it was over. But the, oh. at the time, at the time, I wouldn't have cared if it was a disgusting discharge. I yeah, just yeah. wanted out of there, you know, but, but, but looking back on it in, in a way, all that makes me sad too, because, but it was the, the thing was that we're talking Vietnam era here, yeah. you know, and that was, um, I'll, I'll, I, I would not want to go to Vietnam and, and either lose my life or my sanity or my feet or something for something as complicated, uh, complex and strange as that whole thing was, you know, if, if, if sometimes you have to go to war, but if I'm fighting bad, I mean, you know, there wasn't any question that Hitler had to, he had to be defeated. He had, sure. to be, he had to be, and I yeah. couldn't live myself if I didn't, I'd have been scared to death. Like most people were when you're in war, but I'd like to think that I'd, well, what am I, you know, it'd be worse to, it'd be worse to not go than to go. Yeah. And, and so I think I would have done that had that been the, the case, but we're talking Vietnam. That was a very, it was not a black and white. It, thing. it was not, it was not, you know, and I, and at some point I felt I didn't want to, I was, I mean, I wasn't all that smart, but I was going, I don't, I don't want to be a part of this. I don't even want to be in the Navy air reserves because I don't want to be in the military because, and I mean, but I mean, in a way that's, I mean, it, that was just a sad, complicated thing. And I try not to beat myself up too much over that. But I mean, because like, I really respect the military and I, I respect police and I, I'm not anti-military. Sure. I, maybe, maybe not the big shots, you know, but the, the military, I wouldn't be sitting here talking to you surrounded by guitars if it, yeah, it yeah. for the military, for those guys doing what they're doing. I, I, yeah. I'm, I'm with you I on mean, that. Maybe not in Vietnam, but for them, I don't, I don't have a problem with the military, yeah. you know? And, and, um, I, I might've been a better man had I gone to boot camp, just gotten drafted and gone to the army and been a regular cause being in the reserves, that was just a joke. Like that was a joke that didn't help anybody. And, and, um, uh, and my college years was a joke. It was, it was, everything was just not good. It was just a wait to me. It was all a waste of, a waste of time. You got to lighten up on yourself, man. You were a young kid. You didn't, you do the best you yeah. can in, in, well, in, in, in a well, no, really I, tough situation. Well, I know. And, and, and for the most part I'm over it, but I was just looking over all your questions and I, I was going, ah, oh, this is like a therapy session. <laughs> Except I am ill qualified to be anyone's therapist. Yeah. Any that yeah. scary thing? Well, well, I know, but I, I mean, it makes me think. But, but but I've been thinking about not reliving all that stuff. Although it does come up every once in a while, because sure. every once in a while somebody will want to interview me, and and I try not to. I don't usually get this in depth with all of it, you know. But it's if somebody asks, well, what, when did you, and what? I mean, you know, it's like. I almost have to, if they want to know what I did or where I came, you know, 
just uh, just chronological events in my life. It's it's hard to not get into all that. You know, I I'd rather not, but it's hard. I don't know how to not. I don't know how to not talk about some of that stuff. But and no, it's just story, but, but, man. And it's yeah. I, and ev- look, I think everybody has stuff like this in some way or another. Like you know, there's no easy answers, and you know, we all just like. Fuck! Do the best you can. You know, I mean, I know. Well, I was, I was you slog was, your way through it, and it, it was, it was hard. And I, I mean, yeah. it's like, it's like almost every day of my life from the time I was when I turned eighteen in the summer after high school until I moved down here eight years later when I was getting ready to turn twenty six. Like almost every day of that eight years was like, ah, oh, crap. You know, it was like some obstacle and some. I mean. It, I mean, there were people that had it so much. I mean, I hate to even talk about that stuff. Sound like I'm whining because other people had it so much work. I mean, that all of that stuff was just obstacles to me playing guitar. Yeah, you know, and and compared to the kind of hardships that other people have, it's laughable, you know. But in my own little life, it was it was significant, you know. But no, I think being away and being alone and being a young kid and having no money and then having the pressure of of the service and the moral dilemma of dealing with Vietnam, I think all that adds up and you don't have the coping skills when you're 21, 22. Well, right, right. That's well, the right. problem. And yeah. just the 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 you you just can't uh, uh, the, the 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 cultural chaos Right. That happened in such a short period of time. I mean, you know, some there's there's sometimes in history where so many significant things happen at one time in history, and sometimes it's in a very short period of time. Just and just talking about music history, rock and roll and stuff, the kind of music that came out of nowhere in fifty late fifty five, fifty six through fifty eight and fifty nine. In those two or three years, the the kind of revolutionary music that people are still listening to today yeah. it just changed everything. And that's just rock and roll. That's just a, a pop phenomenon. But then and then and then a lot of that kind of got watered down in the early sixties. Well, then you had Motown and soul music and stuff, and that was all fun and cool. But then you start getting into the mid sixties, and I mean, when I was a young, you know, I'm old enough to wear. I got to experience the rock and roll of the fifties. I I was just barely old enough to experience Mm. it. But in the sixties, I was young enough to get to experience that because I was still just, just a little bit younger than some of the stones and the Beatles. Yeah. But I basically, I mean, some of them were older than me, but I was basically, you know, in that age group. And so I was, I was, uh, I was young enough to, to, I got to do, I got to have a second childhood and, you know, I got to experience the fifties as my music, but that was at a, as a teenager. And then in my early twenties, I got to have, I got to experience all of the, all of that music and that cultural change when people started smoking marijuana and growing their hair long and the music changed and all these in Vietnam, which changed just, it just almost demolished the order of, of things, you know, I mean, uh, people can't, it's hard to imagine now, but there was a, the United States was so different in 64 and 63 than it was like three years later, four years later, you know, or the difference in 64 and 67, it was so, so much happened in that very short period of time that just changed everything, you know, and it was, Mm. It's hard to imagine how chaotic it was, and so I'm old enough to where I remember what it was like before all that happened. Yeah, you know, like in the early '60s, girls were still kind of uh, the uh, however you want to put it. It was uh, it was uh, 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 well the pill and, and and different attitudes. It just everything. It, it, I don't know how good it was for girls in the end, but for guys, it was, <laughs> you know, I mean, golly, because, you know, it was hard. To, it was, it was, it was, a, it was a more uptight. Yeah. The more, sexual revolution oh, changed man. things. Yeah. I mean, you know, and it was even in the early sixties, early mid sixties, 
uh, you were lucky to, I mean, you know, it was, I mean, people were still getting pregnant and getting married and having sex. I mean, that, that, that's, they're always doing that, but, but not like a few years later when Un, you were just, yeah, non-obligated. Uh, what is it? Uh, look, golly, I remember not long after I lived down here, I was sitting on the, my front porch and this little hippie girl was walking down the street and she goes, uh, she just kind of looks over and says, hi. I go, well, hi. And she comes over and says, I just live down the street. Want to come smoke a joint? And I go, well, heck yeah. Uh, wow. Or, 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 I mean, just stuff like that. Yeah, yeah. Just, just and then that led to, uh, I mean, just, sure. you know, it just, it was just like, really? I mean, <laughs> like that, I mean, that didn't, it, that was, the, the, that was beyond fantasy land three years earlier, probably, or five years earlier. I mean, it's yeah. not like that more. I mean, it might be for somebody that's, in their early twenties now, though I don't think so because of the AIDS and so much other, the the, the disease. I mean, there. Oh no, it's then, much more pervasive now. I mean, I mean, back then, back then, uh, you know, you. I mean, somehow I managed to avoid anything serious, but, but uh, you know, everything was different. The dope dealers were they were outlaws. They weren't criminals, really. The the pot dealers. Uh, I knew I, we all knew pot dealers, but they were more like outlaws than criminals, sure. you know, uh, like almost and, like activists. All, almost. But, but I mean, they were just kind of outlaws, you know, I mean, you smoke pot. Yeah, we got some and and they would come to gigs and stuff. And and uh, eventually cocaine just ruined everything. But but it. Uh, but at first, the, even the dope dealers, that like at all the blues gigs, we had pretty girls and high heels. There might have been a bunch of hippie girls all over the place, but the, a lot of the girls that came to the blues gigs were wearing lipstick and perfume, you know. And the, and you look over and you see the outlaw dope dealers leaning at the bar, and it was just a totally different time. And there was some vice and some sinfulness going on, but it, compared to today, it was. I don't know. It was kind of fun and almost innocent compared yeah. to to to, the, to today. But it was just such a radical difference in the late '60s and the early '60s. And now it, everything's changed. Every I don't even know what the hell's going on now. But it's not like it's not like it was before, and it's not like it was after. It's just it's just different. But I don't know everything. You know, I'm I'm totally lost in the modern world. Really, to tell the truth. But, yeah. Well, the only reason I'm not is because I got my kids. They, I'm, yeah. I'm forced to be tethered. <laughs> yeah. Well, I mean, I like, uh, there were, there were some really exciting, it's not like I never had any laughs or never had any fun. I mean, I saw Hendrix twice and cream twice and, and, uh, uh, went to the Louisville pop festival. One of the very early and very only one of the only successful, hippie pop music festivals you know from the that followed up woodstock and there were there was a few of them that were when when though when people were doing that you know i mean there was monterey and there was woodstock and and then uh there was a couple of others and then all the shysters moved in and ruined all those for a long time but there was a lot of fun and a lot of I mean, it's not like I was miserable every day, but I never was able to forget about my situation for a day mm. you know. Uh, but it didn't mean I didn't ever have any fun or any laughs or anything. Or I, I played gigs on weekends and stuff. I just couldn't. I just couldn't do anything very seriously because my situation was so. Every every situation I was in for eight years was a temporary situation. Every day, every it was all temporary. Let's talk. Let's switch gears for just a minute, because you, you just mentioned music, and I want to talk about you backed up some really cool people at Antones. And I was curious if you could, um, if, if there's any interesting stories or what the experience was like with some of these folks and, uh, start with maybe buddy guy. Well, yeah, that's interesting to start with because, uh, depend which buddy I, guy showed up on what well, night, right? Well, that's, 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 <laughs> that's, 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 that's the deal because, uh, yeah. the first time I backed him up, uh, it was before Antone's had a, <clears throat> had a, a real house band. <clears throat> it was in its second location. The Thunderbirds were mostly on the road and Jimmy, the Thunderbirds were mostly on the road and, 
they didn't really have a, a house band, but 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 Clifford Antone got. Uh, I mean, it's also hard to talk about my trip without talking about Antones and Clifford Antone, and a lot of people won't know. You know, it's like when I talk about stuff that's so important to me. Every time I do an interview, I feel like. Well, hell, nobody even knows what the hell I'm talking about. They don't know who I'm talking about or what I'm talking about. So I, it's, it's kind of it's kind of weird to, to, because my anecdotes aren't about Elton John and Ringo Starr. They're about people, you know, local people, Clifford Antone or, or Buddy Guy or, I mean, you know, it's it, it, my whole life is, you know, it, it's been been about obscure things kind of you know hmm. uh, but 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 buddy you know, anyway, anyway anyway so 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 the first time i think so antones do you know about antones that club do you know anything about the antones nightclub i know i just i know of it that it's the big blues hub and it was you know where so many people were showcased and discovered yeah well it was it was quite a phenomenon uh, this guy from port arthur he's a few years younger he died a few years ago but he he was younger than me, and he he grew up in Port Arthur. And Port Arthur, Arthur, that's where uh, Johnny yeah. and Janis Joplin were from, too, right? Right. That's a f- right. funny thing. He was he was younger than them, but <clears throat> but there was a lot of soul in that uh, that town. And uh, anyway, so Clifford moves to Austin, and <clears throat> I didn't know him for a while. He had been here for a little while, and he made a lot of money. Uh, that he couldn't really uh, demonstrate exactly where it came from, shall we say? And <laughs> and he he uh, <clears throat> he he ended up becoming a, a blues fanatic, or well, I don't know the right word. <clears throat> and and he wanted to open up this club, and so he opened up this club right downtown Austin before all these clubs were there, and when there wasn't hardly anything going on in downtown Austin, he called it Anton's Nightclub, and he had money, but he didn't know what the heck he was doing. He opened up, he leased this building that was a, a de, an old department store. It was fairly big, not huge, but it was pretty big. And and it was certainly big enough for some of the acts that he brought in there. But all he wanted in there was blues and, I mean, blues and Louisiana stuff and stuff like that. And and it, it was unbelievable the kind of uh, people that, that came there to play because, like, Austin's a long way from Chicago. But somehow he got somebody, I can't remember who was the first one to come. Somehow the word got, to, he hired somebody from Chicago or the word got, and in 1975, there was lots of blues guys still alive. A lot of them mm. still alive. And, and, um, somebody went back to Chicago and said, <clears throat> you guys ought to, you guys need to go down and see this fellow Clifford Antone in Austin, Texas. You need to go, you need to, you need to check that place out. And, and, and so, um, because Clifford, he worshiped all these guys and he would bring them down and he would pay them good money. And, and if they needed somebody to back them up, he would furnish the, the cream of the crop blues guys around here to back them up if they need it. But, but these, and, and so the word just got around. And so just everybody came down and played and eventually they, lost their location and went to this other crappy location, but they had to take what it would get. And that's when I think Buddy played it the first one in probably 76, 75, something like that. But then when he came back, this band, I was in the Cobras. We backed, we backed him. Stevie had left the band by then, but we backed up Buddy and we were all excited to do it. And it was good. And then Antones went to another location on Guadalupe street and Buddy came back, and the first time or two he came back, it was all exciting and everything, because because he's a killer player and a singer and entertainer, all that stuff and everything. But and Buddy was one of those people that every he just has a charisma, as you know, and yeah. and, uh, and he could play the he's all crazy best guitar playing, and I mean it's great. I shouldn't even be talking about all this, but he would <clears throat> he would start a song. I, mean, I think he still does it. He would start a song and then go, oh wait a minute, here's how Muddy Waters would do that. Song. Yeah, he, he still does it. Yeah. And I mean, it, I mean, we, we did a set. I, I remember doing a set at least where I, I don't think he played one song all the way through. And, and it, <laughs> you know, and it was like, golly, you know, I've seen you him know, like f- four or five times, both in New York City and down here in, in Tampa. And it's really weird. He'll have like two or three different personalities. Like he'll have the one guy that comes out and just really rips it great 
show. They don't have the other guy that comes out and he's kind of angry and he's got to be fucked up. He's got to be a little drunk because he's like, I mean, he just has to be. He's just out there, you know, and he's like motherfucker, motherfucker, the whole concert. So it's really funny. You don't know which buddy guy is going to show up. Yeah. You didn't have this name on your list, but I got to believe you probably backed up Freddie King. Well, yeah, not at Anton's. As a matter of fact, right after, right after Doyle and Jimmy and me uh, moved here, uh, there was this venue that opened up called the Armadillo World Headquarters. It was a yeah, really, uh, yeah. It was a really important venue. It was really great. It was an old National Guard armory. As a matter of fact. I, I'm going to go have lunch with the guy that opened it up. I'm going to have lunch. Eddie Wilson opened up this Armadillo World Headquarters. And everybody from Frank Zappa to Taj Mahal to uh, Bruce Springsteen to ZZ Top and Buffy St. Marie, there wasn't kind of but Willie. I mean, but there, there, anybody that could play in a venue that – I mean, it wasn't, it wasn't a small – it wasn't a club. It was a National Guard armory, but it wasn't – I mean, the Stones couldn't have played there. I sure. mean, if they wanted to, they could have, but it was too big. It was too small for that. But other than that, it was a big concert hall, maybe a thousand people. I don't know what it was. I don't know, maybe more. But everybody played there, and uh, uh, and 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 Eddie Wilson, but and Freddie was playing for all the hippie joints, and he he played black joints, but he also played a lot of white gigs in, in those days in 1970. And I really and, love and, him, man. He's my, of all the, oh, no, I, my no, favorite I blues artist. Yeah, I know. And, uh, I mean, I understand. And, uh, anyway, so he was booked into the Armadillo world headquarters and, and Eddie Wilson, the owner had Jimmy's band that I was in at the time storm back him up. And so we backed him up a couple of nights and then, and then they brought him back a couple of months later and we did it again. And that was this was before uh, Leon Russell, and he started doing all the Shelter record stuff and moving in that direction. So we actually got to play with him at the very end of his <clears throat> Hideaway days and all of his pre-Shelter record stuff. We got to play with that Freddie. What know? was what was, was he like? I got a picture of it. Well, I didn't I didn't get to know him. I got a picture of on my wall in there of uh, of. Uh, well, wait, let me just go and get it real quick. Yeah, man, I'd love to see that. Very that's, cool. Uh, that's about my favorite picture. Yeah, that's a good... I, I, man, when he picks up, there's something about almost every note that guy played really touches me. Yeah, I know. Incredible. I know. A any cool stories? Oh, well, no, I didn't I didn't get to know him. I... I uh, we I was in another band a couple of years after that, and we we opened for him because there was some there were supposed to be three bands on the bill and a couple of them didn't show up or canceled for some reason I don't remember why and so the promoter I was in this I was in this this local band and and they asked us to open up for him at the last minute so we did and and before we played i wasn't really used to playing at big venues like that it was at a it was at a bigger venue here in town and and i i was just wandering around backstage looking for the dressing room and and we wandered into his and and uh he was sitting there with a case of beer and and i i i kind of said hello or something people standing around and i didn't realize that that was his beer his beer <laughs> But I walk over to this cooler and I help myself to a beer. And he didn't say anything, but he kind of looked at me and I was thinking, uh, I think that was his beer, not our beer. Oh, not I mean, the I venue's was, beer, yeah. Not not the opening band's beer. That was his beer. But he didn't say anything, but I thought he gave me a look. But, the, but, but when I was playing with him, we were backing him up and we were all scared to death because it's fucking Freddie King, you know? And, <laughs> yeah. and uh, I was, and he was a big man too, like physically, he was wasn't he? He was, he was big. Yeah. And, and we're standing there playing and we're scared, you know, and he's doing all this stuff and, and we, and, and he does hideaway, you know, hideaway, right? Yeah, of and, course. Yeah. And, and right. And so, you know, the, the piano part goes, Da 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 da, ba 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 ba. You know that part. Yeah. Da, well, <clears throat> he was doing Hideaway, and I, when he, 
he did da 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 And on my guitar, I did an E7 chord. I went, bop, bop, bop. I did the piano part, and he looked over at me when I did that, and he smiled at me. I went, okay, that's good. So oh, he, cool. So you were in. I, I think, uh, well, I don't know about that, but he it made him smile, and I think, I think it made him, because he didn't, well, actually, he knew Jimmy, but he didn't know us, and he, we were just a, some white kids backing him up, you yeah. know, but, but when he, when he heard me do that, and I think it made him go, well, this might be okay, you know, and, uh, and anyway, it meant a lot to me for him to just look over at me when he, I mean, I, I'll never forget that. Yeah. You know? yeah. I mean, when I played that part was, so you don't like, if I said it was easy to deal with or whatever, you really wouldn't have a frame of reference. I, I, no, no, yeah. I didn't, I didn't never get to know him or really talk to him or anything. Um, I read something on your website or your bio and you said it was apparent, you know, that both Vaughn brothers had something special and it was no surprise and they became successful. What was that quote, something special for each of them? And, and do you have any idea, you know, just again, in your opinion, where that came from or why did that exist even? Well, no, I mean, you can't really, I mean, you know, they're not the only people I know that, you know, people that, I mean, there's always been people that, even in their youth just showed that, I mean, you know, they just stuck out, you know, they just, they just stuck out, whether it was an artist or a writer or a singer or a piano player or, or something. And, and, uh, I don't, who knows where that comes from? You know, I don't know. And, um, uh, Jimmy came up in a totally different family. His, his dad would take them to, to, he would go play gigs with older people and, I think at beer joints or something, and Jimmy's daddy would go there, and he'd be drinking the beer, and uh, he and he had some relatives that played, and I think they'd sit around his house when he was a kid, and they would play music and drink beer and stuff. And I mean, I never had that kind of thing, but I, but and I don't really know exactly. I've never really talked to him about it, but I don't really know exactly when when he knew that he want, he he started playing younger than than I was when I started playing. I started playing when I was about 14 or something. And he started playing, he and Stevie started playing when they were younger than that. But, and I don't really know what, what got them. I mean, Stevie might've got started playing because Jimmy did. Sure. <clears throat> but I don't really know what, how Jimmy decided to pick up the guitar in the first place. I don't, I don't know, yeah. but, but I mean, just, I, I don't, I can't, you know, I don't know about them any more than, I mean, you know, I know other people that have just, just as a child or, I mean, I can't really think of any right off that just, they just, ha- they just, they just had something. You don't know what it is or where it came from. You know, yeah. you don't know, yeah. but, but the, but I remember hearing about Jimmy when I was up in going to school up in Denton, Jimmy was se- Jimmy seven years younger than me. And w- he was playing around Dallas. He, he didn't for one reason or another, he didn't have to worry about the draft for whatever reason. And, so he was playing around and we called them Beatle bands because by the time Jimmy started being in his band, at least by his second band, when he was like 16 or 17, that's when the, the English stuff was, was already here. And, and so they were playing of the, your first band, you were playing Yardbirds or, or Beatles or stuff like that. And, and, uh, but Jimmy was a he. I, I was. I kept hearing his name, even though I was going to Denton and and older than that crowd of people. I I, w- I heard his name, and I went and heard him in '67 playing at this at this. Uh, he was sitting in with some other friends of mine on a matinee gig on a Sunday afternoon in Dallas, and I I went to see my friends, I guess. And but Jimmy and his band, the Chessmen, came in and they sat in, and and I I think they played. Uh, maybe a Beatles song, maybe a Yardbird song. Well, Jimmy, they, Jimmy played uh, Jeff's Boogie. Yeah, great. great and team. and uh, and and he played it. Not only did he just play it note for note, but he just he had the sound. You could just tell. I don't care if it's a cover. I don't care if it's Jeff's song. That guy's a good guitar player. You could just you could just tell that he was a better guitar player than most people already at yeah. at, at, at sixteen or seventeen or however old he was. You could just I mean, I, you know, I can tell a good guitar player when I hear one, you know, sure. and he, 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 I'd heard has already been hearing his name. And even though they were just playing covers at the time, I was going, oh, that guy, that guy's good. And then, uh, when I heard Stevie, 
I didn't know I didn't I didn't know Stevie until a few Stevie. I guess I met Stevie before he moved down here because once Jimmy moved down here, Stevie had come down here, you know, and play or hang out or something. And I met I met Stevie. I probably met I probably met Jimmy when he was about eighteen, maybe eighteen, nineteen, and I met Stevie when he was probably seventeen, something like that. And and I heard uh, Stevie's band called Blackbird, and he was he was seventeen, but you could tell that he he was he had already latched on to the Albert King kind of thing, mm. and and it was obvious that it was a Albert King kind of thing, but but he kind of had command of it, and it and it it was Albert King was such a he had such an identifiable cool take on shit that yeah. if Stevie picked up on it and incorporated it into everything he did, it just it. it, it it, just, it was just cool. It just worked. And, it, and at first, it seems like he was relying on that a lot. But still, even if he was relying on that, it still set him apart from everybody. Yeah, sure, sure. And Jimmy, the Jimmy, the way I would characterize the two of them is the, just me. It's like uh, Jimmy really seemed to really get a lot from bb jimmy could nail bb really good i've never been able to nail anybody but jimmy could if he wanted to just sound like bb and and just learn the cool licks and his the vibrato and everything and stevie went to albert you know right. uh, St- B- jimmy went to bb and stevie went to albert and uh they both developed their own thing from sure. that but but i think uh Stevie, the, to me, that was that was the difference, and uh, and um, uh, maybe you're going to ask it later. But like Jimmy played less, and Stevie played more. Stevie, Jimmy played less notes. Stevie played more notes. Sure. That was, yeah. I mean, and and but they were both, but 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 audiences reacted to both of them. I mean, you know, it's people that even if they didn't like, there was something about the way they played. It might have been the fact that Jimmy just played BB so good, and people were hearing like it was almost like they were hearing what BB had played. Well, that sounds good. He's yeah. a good guitar player. But but Jimmy it, Jimmy was more than just. I'm not saying that's all Jimmy. No, did. no, he was clearly. But yeah. that but that seemed to really uh, affect his thinking about playing the guitar, and and the way Albert played. I mean. Stevie played a million times more notes than Albert did later on, you know, but, but, but Albert's approach. The really power. Was, yeah. The power behind the power. Yeah, for sure. Man. And and so uh, I think those are the, the, you know, the main, main differences, but, 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 but they were both so young to latch onto those cats. I mean, it's like when I was, it's hard to understand these days. I mean, there's, there's always going to be some, you're always going to hear about some four, oh, you got to hear this 14 year old player. God, he's really good. Yeah. He sounds just like Stevie or something. I go, well, so do a whole lot of people these days. I'm kind of tired of hearing people that sound like Stevie, but, but, you know, but it's kind of, it's a little bit more unusual to hear a 16 year old sound like BB King, yeah. you know? Yeah. And, uh, uh, what it, whatever that, that's editorial there, but let me ask you this, Denny. If it's even possible to answer this, you've you've you're, you've had a pretty rich and you know robust career doing so many things. If is it possible for you to pick out maybe like the top three things, experiences that you've had either because of your role in it, the 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 hang of the other people you're involved with, or um you know, just the actual music that you played, what would be like your top three, if that's even possible? Well, I, I mean, I certainly would leave things out, but the, what, the, 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 what, what was the, what was the category? Well, you know, just the, the top three experiences you had musically, you know, and it could be for any reason, like your particular stuff that you did, you're particularly proud of the experience in general, uh, the personalities involved, you know, where it was just like the chemistry. Well, well, I, I mean, uh, just like when I talk about my life, I can't, 
it's hard to avoid talking about all that stuff I talked about mm. early life. And and in my later life, even though it was much later, it's hard to talk about anything significant without talking about my years with Bob Dylan, even though, I don't, even though I don't like to talk about that. But if you play with Bob Dylan for five years, that's, I mean, that, it, 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 that there's no way that that's not maybe the most significant thing I ever did, I guess. Yeah. I was, I was I mean, thinking Bob Dylan. Be, yeah. I was thinking that would be up there, man. And, um, uh, maybe just being in the, Antone's house band for several years because uh, we got to back up and get to know a little bit and hear a lot of our heroes that I never thought I'd ever get to hear. I mean, you know, Austin, Texas is a long, I mean, I traveled around a bit and, and I, I've heard people in other parts of the country and other parts of the world, but, but like to just live here in Austin and have those people come to you and, and, and we had a great house band and we backed up, our our the, some of the most heavy blues cats that were still and there was a, in the through the eighties there was a lots of heavy blues cats still alive. I mean we I didn't back up T Bone Walker, and I didn't back up some people, but I mean I could. There's a long list of people that came to Antones from 1975 till well now there's not many left now, but Antones opened in '75 and. I got another picture in, on my wall in there. I, I wasn't really wasn't really a house band, but when when Antones first opened, it, it coincided with the Thunderbirds forming mm. with Jimmy and Kim and, and everything, and and uh, they kind of were the default house band. If 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 Clifford brought in some somebody and they didn't bring a whole band, the Thunderbirds were just getting together and. And Antones was their home base, and so they backed up a lot of people. and And one night there was some nights. I mean, some nights it was it was unbelievable to us. I mean, some people don't even know who these people are. But it was. I've got a picture of my wall in there, where in the picture, all playing on, on the stage at the same time. John Lee Hooker's sitting there playing. Big Walter Horton is playing harp. Eddie Taylor is playing guitar. Who, who was an important guy behind the scenes, behind Jimmy Reed and a lot of other people. He made his own records that he's kind of obscure, but he's an important blues guy. Hubert Sumlin, who played lead on the Hal and Wolf record. Yeah. And uh, I have to look, but uh, Keith Ferguson, the Jimmy's bass player, but it was Big Walter, John Lee Hooker, Eddie Taylor, and Hubert Sumlin were just sitting there playing, and I'm on piano over there with them um and that but that was just a night at anton that was just a night that uh and then things changed and they moved a couple of locations and there got to be a we, we ended up needing a house band and so i was i played guitar and piano in the house band and 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 just the the the, as the further you got into the 90s the more of all of our blues heroes that we started losing. Yeah. But just, I mean, if all you did was think about from 75 till 1990, there was a cavalcade of blues giants that we got to hear and, and back up. And did, did you work with uh, Sue Foley when she was like basically a little, a young girl or a young lady? I, I didn't, I think I played on a, a couple of tracks on a, album i think maybe and um okay and she was uh, and i i didn't ever play in a band with her but i'm sure i was on stage with her but but i've actually been playing in the last couple of years been playing some gigs with her okay yeah I, she's, I been, didn't... she's she's been hanging out here and uh and sometimes we do shows together she'll do a show with and i play with luann barton and they are on the same show and and there's been a couple of gigs where luann barton used me and Sue on guitar. So yeah. I, I, in the, in the, in the last year or so, I've actually played with Sue more than I've ever played with her. Yeah. Cause I had interviewed her a while back and she was telling me she basically came down to Antones when she was like 17. Yeah. I remember. Yeah. And, 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 but, and, and she was good, but these days she just, she's, 
she's badass. Yeah, she's, she's she she looks real good and she plays good and yeah. she dresses good. Yeah, she's 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 she's, she's badass. I she's badass. She scares me. She's badass. Yeah, she's very talented, man. What would be number three? So you got Bob Dylan, all your experiences at Antones. What would be number three? Oh, I was going to tell you the third thing. Yeah, the I, third thing. I mean, I, I don't. I mean, I'm not sure exactly. I, you, it, you, I might answer it different on a different day. But, but anyway, so, so around somewhere around 1990, uh, this young guy from Adelaide came up here on a musical. Uh, I forgot the word I used a while ago. Uh, pilgrimage. He he went to he went to probably maybe Memphis and New Orleans and maybe some other place, but he stuck around Austin a long time because he was a guitar player. They had, he had kind of an R and B band in Adelaide, just a little band. And he said, uh, he said, uh, Hey, look, uh, why don't you come down to Australia? I've got a band. We'll back you up. We'll learn your songs and back you up and we can book some gigs and just come down and have a good time, make a little bit of money and play. And I, I'd never really, I, I'd probably done a few gigs on my own, but that's not what I do really, you know, and, and, and I, I've certainly never toured in a country that didn't know me hmm. uh, under my own name. And I didn't really know the band or him or anything. He had given me a, a 45 or a cassette or something. And I listened to it and it sounded like, well, it's kind of a Booker T kind of band, kind of, kind of R and B. That's a, and I mean, so there was kind of no reason for me to go, yeah, hell yeah. So I would, yeah, sure, I'll go do it. So, so I go down to, I mean, it was heavy for me because I went all the way to Australia. Yes. Yeah, to, to, to play a month's worth of gigs backing me up on a band that I was counting on to learn my songs to go play instrumentals all over, well, not all over Australia, but a month's worth of gigs in Australia with, with guys I didn't know in a place that didn't know me. I said, yeah, okay, sure. So I go down there and they turn out to be real nice guys. And we rehearse and we have our first rehearsal a day or two after I'm there. And, and they had done all their homework and learned more of my songs than anybody here knew. And, uh, and we were playing. I said, well, I said, we, uh, to start off the rehearsal, I said, let's just play a shuffle. Let's just, let's just play. Let's just play. I wanted to, I, I, that was a, that's always a good barometer. And, and, uh, so it sounded great. And I, the drummer, he was like young at the time, maybe 19 or something like that. He was young. I said, young Matthew, how'd you learn how to do that? He said, I just put on, uh, me Albert Collins records and earphones that I just played along with Albert <laughs> Collins. Well, okay. That's a good way to learn a shuffle. So, <laughs> So, it, but, but anyway, so the fact that I was in Australia doing a tour under my own name, playing my own songs was, and I went back and did it a couple of years later. And, uh, that was, uh, significant to me that we yeah. were doing, it, getting away with it. Cause I'd never, you know, I wouldn't have ever on my own thought, I know what I'll go. You're an artist now. Go, go book a book a tour in Australia. With a band I don't know, but it worked out great. And, and and to these to this day, they're those guys are still my friends, my good friends, especially a couple of them that are brothers. They're they they're still my good friends. And uh, so, but but anyway, that was that was uh, that was to, that meant a lot to me for them to ask me to do it to do that. And I did a tour under my own name, which I, it's a, maybe, the, I mean, I've done gigs, but that's the first time I ever went to another country and did a tour under my own name. Yeah. That's a big, uh, leap of faith. But, yeah, it was. Yeah. Good for you, man. I'm glad that worked out. That's really cool. Hey, let's talk about gear for a few minutes. Um, I would imagine you've played like hundreds and hundreds of guitars over the years. I was curious, what's your go-to guitar right now, and and what other two guitars might round out your top three? Well, I don't know if I played that many over the years, but I, I tend to have a few and keep them as long as I can keep them. I mean, I've still had several guitars, but and 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 sad to say, I don't really have 
I've only got one guitar that I've, well, I, golly, I guess I've had it a long time now. I mean, I don't think of it as an old guitar, but, but I, my oldest guitar is a reissue Strat, but it was among the very first reissues that when they first started reissuing Strats, Clifford Antone got it for me. And, and, um, it's, uh, I mean, it's old and beat up now and it's kind of my favorite guitar. And it's like whenever they first started doing that, f the, their first reissues, I think it was like around 80, 81, something like that. I may be wrong, but I don't, I don't remember any, seems to me like this is when they first started putting out a reissue. I was going to say and, early. Is, so it's a reissue of what? It's like a 62 uh, or a 58? Uh, 50, 57, I think. Do you have it and, handy? Yeah. Let me see. Can I see it, man? I'd love yeah. to. So it's, uh, you see it? Yeah. Oh, wow. That's nice and that's nice and that's a real relic. It's not a fake relic, man. Right. So it's caught on fire. I think this is the one I put a cigarette up there and got kind of, I think I put it in my case with the cigarette still burning and I started to catch on fire. But oh, all wow. of these, all of this, all of this, it's all me. Yeah. That's a, and I, I had, I had somebody pinstripe it. That's but, a rosewood neck. It looks like from here. No. Oh, it's, it's, just oh, it's a, just a dirty worn. Oh, wow, man. That is awesome. So let me describe it. It's a yellow. Can, can you hold it just a little higher, Denny? Yeah. Okay. So it's a, a white pick guard. Um, it's a yellow. It, was it, what color is that originally? Is it? Well, they, like, they had a name for it. It was, um, it was, it was, it was a little bit too yellow kind of cre I think it was supposed to kind of, I think it was supposed to look like a yellowed whiter one or something, yeah. you know, but it, but, but it was, I mean, it was, it was, um, it was a little bit, it was, I don't know. It was, um, kind of cream colored. It wasn't banana bright yellow, but it, and it wasn't, it wasn't yellow, but it was kind of yellowish kind of. But I, but I really, I've got a, I Real, guess I've got. Man, and the neck is so worn. It, it looks great, man. Yeah. Well, right. I mean, it was brand new when I got it. So has that ever been refretted? Oh yeah. Wow. And it's the, is it the pickups or the like uh, rewires of the original 57s? Yeah, that's cool, man. Very cool, beautiful guitar, man. And he, the uh, other, maybe the I've got I've only, I've got maybe just regular guitars. I I don't have that many. I might have about twelve or something. This is another one I like a lot. I can't play it that good, but it's a it's a is that a twelve string? I can't see it. No, oh, it's, that, a one, it's a one seventy five. Okay, it's a one seventy five. It's a beautiful guitar, man. It's like a mid sixties. I've just had this about ten years. That's a beautiful the, guitar, man. What's, yeah. Is there any any cool story behind how you got that one? Nope. I just kind of always wanted one and walked into my friend's music store, and I was playing with Bob at the time, I think, and or shortly. I had I had some money for one of the first times in my life, and I I'd always wanted one, and I just I, I just I bought it. I, I it's not it. There's nothing wrong with the guitar, but I don't really play it so good. It's like the 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 only the, the only guitar I really feel like I have any kind of control over is a Strat. Really, I don't. I, I've got I've got a couple of uh, Epiphone Firebirds, and I've got a Gibson V, and I've got uh, four other Strats, and and a Epiphone Hollow Body region or something and uh i kind of like but people gave me about half of those i've only bought about five about half of the guitars that i've got but uh that's pretty good yeah. that people gave you five guitars you know a bunch of those guitars denny yeah that's, that's not too common and um well I, I it's in my car i hadn't unloaded it but like the 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 thing that i'm really obsessing with right now as of about the last three or four years, I, I started getting into steel guitar and, uh, I, I just played a gig last night and it's still in the car, but this is another one I just bought. This is a, Oh, that's, cool. That's an old Supro right there. But the, the, the main, my main guitar that I'm kind of obsessed with and almost all I want to do 
It's a, uh, do you know steel guitars? I'm, I have not played one. I've seen them and I know steel guitars. I don't, I've never picked one uh, up to be honest with you. Well, they're right. Well, I'd picked over the years. I might've approached one and I go pick up the bar or something or try to put, I didn't know how to put on the finger. I didn't know how to put on the picks or, or anything about it. I go, ah, never mind. It's too hard. And then, and then, um, uh, I got, but I, I start. I never really paid any attention to steel at all. Do you know Junior Brown? Um, California. Junior Brown. Yeah, is no, he? Not, he where, is he in California? No, steel player. But is no. he out of California? No, I don't know him. You thinking of Junior Watson? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Sorry. Yes. No, Junior uh, Brown is a. He's a. He's a really amazing steel player. He's actually had some success. A certain amount of success. He. He's the. Have you heard of the, he's got, he dreamed, he plays guitar and steel and he, he had a dream and he was always playing steel and then picking up a guitar and playing steel, picking up a guitar. And he had a dream about this thing and he had it made and it's called a git steel. And so it's a, it's a, it's, it's, it's like a half guitar and half steel and one, well, maybe it's more than one piece of wood glued together, but he stands up and he's got the, he can play the, he can reach down and play the steel but on the stand attached to the piece of wood of the steel is a guitar. So he can, it's, That's it's pretty, it's where's, a, where's he out of? Well, I'm not sure where he lives right now, but he, I think he might, I don't know if he's from New Mexico or what, but he, he showed up in town back in the eighties and I used to go hear him play. And I, I, I never really was into country or anything and never really paid, given any thought to steel guitar. And he doesn't play pedal. He plays plays non pedal. No, but no. but he was he was he was he moved to town and was playing with different people, and I was hearing him in non country because I just at the time I didn't really care about country and I was hearing him in non country context and and I was I was kind of hearing the steel for the first time and I thought well now that I'm in the room with it I, I like it it sounds good and then he started going over to Jimmy's house and Jimmy started getting in, getting into it and Jimmy bought a couple. And I guess Junior showed him some things, and all of a sudden Jimmy was playing steel guitar, and I and and I had Jimmy play, it, and not long after that I started making my my first record, and I had Jimmy play steel on my first two albums, and he played Jimmy played really good, really quick. He went right, he was really good, real quick, and and so I've kind of just loved, been a fan of steel ever since, but I never really. I didn't think I could play one. And then a few years ago, I came across one at my girlfriend's house that had belonged to her ex-husband. And I said, where'd that come from? And she said, that was DK's. And I said, and he had passed away. And I said, I said I'm taking that home. And I, I wanted to take the steel guitar. This is a few years ago. I said, I didn't really want to pay $400 for one and not be able to play it, but I would take this one home and spend some time with it. So I, I took it home and, started messing with it and and I I, I wasn't going to give up until I actually spent a little bit of time with it. And and I spent some time with it and I was going, gosh, I wonder maybe I can do this. Maybe I can and and I kind of figured out the neck wasn't figuring out the neck and the layout of the strings and all that wasn't that big a deal. The the hard part was playing in tune with the bar and and the finger picks. The technique of playing it was what was really hard. But I thought, wow, that's God, but it sounds so cool. And maybe just maybe I could do it, but I'm going to anyway, 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 that's what got me started. And then I ended up buying a fence. That was just a, that was just a little practice hundred dollar one. And then I got a six string fender. And then, then this friend of mine loaned me her double neck, eight string fender old one. And, and then I bought another fender and then I Charlie Sexton loaned me a old double neck Rickenbacker, and then I came across this the other. So now I'm kind of obsessed with steel guitars. They're all tuned different, and and um, the 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 double neck Fender is uh, the one I'm kind of obsessing on now. And I'm I'm not really playing blues on it. I'm I, th- this this regular gig that I have on Wednesday. It's the same personnel as the Friday gig. But we do, we do, it's all total hillbilly. It's Webb Pierce, Lefty Frizzell, Hank Williams, uh, Hank Snow, Ernest Tubb, all that. That's all we do. And, and, um, and that's the kind of steel play. And I yeah. like old, old, old school, non-pedal. That's what I'm just kind of 
obsessing about it. It was funny last night. I actually broke a string because there's this trick where you 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 bend a string with your finger to make it kind of sound like a steel guitar effect. And and I broke the string when I did it. And uh, it was near the end of the gig, so it wasn't that big a deal. I had I and I was thinking, well, I broke a string. Well, I've only got 15 strings left on this guitar. <laughs> I, I make it through the rest you of can, the night. You can handle it. You can swing it. That's yeah, man. It's good to see you so enthusiastic about something you know well no it's great because that's uh, exactly that's exactly the point because in the recent past i I w- i'd realized that i wasn't really getting all that excited about much you know and in mm. the past there was always kind of something to get into or excited about or, or something and i realized god it seems like it's been a long time but once i picked up that steel guitar and brought it home the last few years, I mean, I try to practice a couple of hours every day. That's great. And, uh, and, and, and this gig that we do on Wednesday, that's what I look forward to more than anything. The blues and, gig. No, the country gig. Oh, the country gig. Okay. Right. Right. And, uh, I mean, so, I mean, I mean, I, my, my, my girlfriend's little grandbaby and the steel guitar. I mean, I, I like all my other gigs. So I play, I play a lot. I play 15 times a month, I guess. And, but but I'm really 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 lucky because I have something that makes me happy. Like I mean, to, to just play my steel guitar every day the, that makes me happy to do that. That's and I'm cool. finally I'm finally actually kind of getting over this plateau to where I can trick people into thinking I play good. I don't, <laughs> I don't think you got to trick anybody, man. Well, I mean. <laughs> I'm still obviously a student, but I, but I can, I, there's certain things I can do. It's just like on P I'm not a piano player. I'm not an organ player, but I can make people think that I am. You know? <laughs> You've done a pretty but good I, job. I, I know, well, I know what all my limitations are. Mm. So I don't, I don't, I have too many limitations to call myself a piano player or an organ player. I mean, it's funny. I go play an organ every once in a while. I don't have one, but I like it. They have one at Antone's or this other club. I play, somebody will ask me to play an organ sometime. And I, it's funny because it's, I bet I'm the only guy that ever plays an organ gig. When I get there, I go, now, how do you turn this thing on now? (laughs) I always, is it start first or run first? Another day I went, okay, I think I, okay, I think it's, you, you put, you, you hold down the start for 10 or 15 seconds and then pull the other switch and that starts it. But I was doing that the other day and it was going, Okay, I think I got that right, but it's not starting. No noise. And then I asked somebody, and somebody came up there and said, "Well, why don't you plug this in right here?" <laughs> <laughs> One of the cables. It was in the dark, and I didn't realize that it was un. I mean, you know, I don't yeah. even. It's funny to go play to get paid to play an instrument. And you go now. How do you start this thing? Hey, thank God for that. You know, that's a good problem that you're having. The only, the only, I interviewed a couple of steel players. One of them plays in Austin once in a while. Cindy uh, Cash Dollar. Cash, yeah, she left yeah. town. She, right, right as I was starting to play, she moved yeah. back to uh, Woods, Woodstock. Woodstock. Yeah, she's a hell of a player, man. Hey, yeah, heck yeah. And another guy. Do you know Russ Paul? No, is he's he here. No, he's out oh. of Nashville. Ru- Russ no. is out of Nashville. Yeah, he's. A, I'm he's trying good. to take some lessons here. I've taken a couple, but I need to take some more. But I mean, I'm kind of obsessed with it. I. I that's great, it. man. I remember Jimmy said, it's just got the ultimate guitar tone. And I thought about it and I went, yeah. Hey, quickly, just to interrupt, um, I am I just thought of this. I'm sure that was a pretty significant experience working with Bob Dylan for five years. And I was curious, how did you get that gig in the first place? Well, I, I'm not really sure of, 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 the, of all the chronology of it, but um, a year before I got the gig, a friend of mine that uh, manages Jimmy Vaughn called me up and he said, hey, look, uh, Bob wants Jimmy to go out with him because his one of his guitar players is sick and he just wants somebody to go out for two or three weeks to finish up this tour. But Jimmy's wife is getting ready to have twins and he doesn't he can't go. And so Corey said, I want to see, I want to, I want to tell him about you. And I said, well, tell him about me. So he, so Corey, the manager got with Bob's people and said, Jimmy can't do it, but have I got the guy for you? And 
and they said, well, I don't know who that guy is. And, and so we overnighted him a couple of my CDs and didn't really hear anything for a while. And um, I found out later that they they were up in New England when this happened, I think. And they called up somebody that they knew that they had actually worked with before. And they had him just come in and finish up the tour. And then and then he uh, he actually stayed on. And then a year later. I got a call from somebody a year after that initial thing that didn't come, that didn't, uh, didn't really happen. I got a call from the, his office saying, can you, can you come uh, to Los Angeles and rehearse with Bob Dylan? And I was going rehearse. What for? I'm not in his band. Why might I want to rehearse with him? <laughs> you know? But I didn't, all I said was of course, well, yeah, sure. Sure. Yeah. And so I went out there and uh, uh, I, I actually knew the bass player a little bit and I knew the road manager, but I didn't know the rest of the guys. But Charlie had all Charlie Sexton had already worked with them. And so there was an Austin connection with the road manager and the bass player had lived in Austin. And I didn't know it for a long time, but Jimmy and Stevie had had actually recorded with Bob. I didn't even know that, but they had recorded with him. And they're, they, they, I think they're, they're playing on a few tracks on some record. I don't even know what it is, but I didn't know that. But the point is, is the organization had experience with Charlie and the road manager and Tony and Jimmy and Stevie. They had had all this experience with Austin people, you know, and what, and, and a year later after that initial call, they decided to make a change in the band. And so they needed a guitar player. And, and so I guess they were going, well, who are we going to get? And they didn't know me, but I think that they said, well, who was that guy we called last year? And well, let's maybe let's, didn't he send a couple of CDs or something? And anyway, all I know is, is uh, I knew that they had, my, my friend had submitted my name a year before and then they followed up on it a year later and I went out to rehearse with them for three days. And at the end of every rehearsal, those three days in Santa Monica there at the end of every day, I was going, well, if this is an audition, I ain't getting this gig. You know? <laughs> Why? You didn't I think mean, you played well or? Well, it wasn't that it was just so crazy. And the, the they had, they had also the, a new person in the band that they had just hired was this, uh, Alana James, a, a, a woman fiddled, player and they also hired don heron from br549 who played steel and banjo and mandolin and everything like that and and uh and i'm sitting over here and i'm looking well there's a girl over there playing a fiddle and here's a guy holding a banjo and i'm going what the hell am i doing here you know <laughs> i've never played with a banjo before you know it was more like a, a country a country before. band Right, and and they were getting ready to they were getting ready to go out, and uh, and Merle Haggard was going to uh, play on the bill with them. Okay, and so they they even rehearsed some song, but they were just playing anything. They were just jamming and playing just anything, just kind of jamming. It wasn't that much of a rehearsal. It was they were just playing and kind of checking everybody out. But it was it was kind of chaotic, and they were playing songs that I'd never heard before. Some of his songs I'd never heard them before, and and some country songs and some stuff. And I was, I mean, I'm pretty good at playing on the fly, you know, but I didn't really feel like I did very good. And I was doing what, what, what am I doing here? Are they going to, going to go out with Merle Haggard? They got a banjo and a steel guitar over there and a fiddle here and a fiddle there. And I was going, golly. And then, but then the, the, after the, the third night, they said, uh, well, if I, I don't know what we're going to do, I don't know what we're going to do. But I said, they said, uh, would you be interested in going out with us if we decide to, you know, well, that's what we want to do. And I said, well, yeah, sure. And so I, I left and went where I was staying because I was living in Dallas at the time. And later that night they called me and said, we want to offer you the gig. And I went, well, I was really shocked really. And I said, you mean you want to go out and look, try it out? And they said, no, we're offering you the gig. And I went, okay. But I was, thinking, <laughs> yeah, yeah, we'll see about this. But, but anyway, I, I did it for nearly five years, and I, I 
I, I can only assume that 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 when they decided to get a guitar player a year later, that they listened to my CDs and probably thought, well, this guy plays okay, you know, he's he's you, I don't know, let's give him a call. I don't even know who else to call. You know, <laughs> they didn't really know. I mean, I you know, like I said, I knew the bass player Tony Garnier, and I knew the road manager. And I knew Charlie, who had already played with him, mm. but I didn't know anybody in the organization at the time. But but I went out with them. And and you played on a Grammy-winning record. You got a platinum. Yeah, I got a, the, on a, a year after I joined up, we recorded uh, Modern Times. And I was, I'm real proud of uh, that. And then we went, and, when I was with him over those, over that period of time, every once in a while we would go into a studio. We went, I remember we went in Nashville one day and, and I think in, uh, somewhere in Ireland and so, I don't know, all over the place. Every once in a while we'd go in the studio to record something and we wouldn't even really know what it was for. We'd record one song or, or two songs and they wouldn't even really tell us what, what it was for or something. But, and then some of those tracks have ended up on miscellaneous, uh, Bob Dylan albums. I mean, there's so many bootlegs out there, but and and I think some of those tracks might have ended up on officially released records, but I don't I don't really know. I don't even know. You know, I, I don't know. We I, I'm saying is that was the only album I played on all the way through, hmm. and then just miscellaneous tracks that ended up here and there. I think I once read something. He's the most bootleg artist, but he's also been around longer than anybody else. I think. Well, yeah, but these days, I mean, I, I didn't, I wasn't aware of like the term Bob head, you know, but, but it's, I, I became aware of that pretty quick, you know, and, and it's like, um, it's like a deadhead. Yeah. These people are, uh, yeah, I guess, but these people are fanatical in that they want to know every, every scrap of information about him or anybody that plays with him or anything. And, and, and they, by the time the way we operated, we'd, we'd do a gig and then, and then after the show go straight to the bus and drive to the next town. That's just, I mean, there was exceptions, but that's the way we operated. And, and, and in every case, by the time we got where we were going, the bootlegs were already released to the thousands of bob heads all over the world because from, from the last you, show these days you can't stop somebody from recording the show you know you, they got recorders and microphones that you put in your shirt pocket you know mm. and and they have some really good gear and there's these certain guys that record every single show every single yeah. show and they post them on the, the uh, every gig that he plays by the time the band wakes up the previous gig is all over the internet well you every, know so that's why i think bands like government mule are so successful because they have a recording studio they record every show and then they put it up at studio quality, you know, soundboard quality, and then they post it up for sale the next day. So they've turned well, that and you said, might well, you might as "Well, because you can't, you can't stop it. It's not like, a, I mean, there's no way to, you can't stop it. Just like you can't stop somebody from taking a picture, you know, right. you can't with the technology today. You cannot stop somebody from, uh, and, and a lot of those recordings are very good quality. So you can't yeah. stop it. So you either just go, okay, go ahead or you do it yourself and put it up. But, but they don't, the, the, the organization doesn't have to do it because they got people out there every night with expensive gear recording it and putting it up for them, you know, and it doesn't seem to hurt their shows or anything yeah. else. So it, you know, they don't, they don't seem to mind so much. No, but I think mule is really smart because they, it's like, and you, you're selling a record for 10, you know, a, a digital recording for 10 bucks. So you think, is it worth it for me to pay $10 to get the best quality recording versus getting some bootleg? To me, I'd always, I, I pay the money every day, you know, and plus I just support artists, but, you know, um, and I value intellectual property, but, you know, um, I think guys like that are smart. There's a couple of bands that Peter Frampton did that when we, I saw Frampton when he did the 35th anniversary tour of, um, uh, Frampton Comes Alive, uh, it was about 10 years ago. They had the same thing. Right after the show, you could buy the record. They were pressing them right there. Well, that, 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 everything's different, and you have to adapt. You yeah. just have to adapt to it one way or another, you know, and and and, and sometimes it actually ends up working for you, uh, uh, you know. I mean, especially if you have fans that just love you and are loyal and want everything that you ever do or, you know, so you don't want to upset your fans. Yeah. 
Well, cool. Thanks for sharing that story. Let me ask you just about music in general. If I asked you to pick your three Desert Island discs, I know this is a tough question for you because you you like a lot of music. You've been around a while. Um, in no particular order, Denny, what would you, what the well, three I saw, albums? I saw that you were going to ask that, so I thought about it, and I also realized, well, this is, you know, uh, it could, it, you know, that it, that it would be tough to put a hundred. Yeah. Albums on. Right. But, but, um, one of them, a safe one would be kind of blue miles. And, uh, I would have to have maybe a Jimmy Reed in the, uh, a Jimmy Reed album called I'm Jimmy Reed. And then there's a, a more obscure album by this, uh, I guess you'd call it Western swing guy from the early sixties, a live album called, uh, uh, Brisbane, B R I S B A N E uh, from Brisbane, California, not Australia, Brisbane bop B O P by a, a guy named Jimmy rivers. It's just the most incredible. It, it's a live gig. The drummer would just take his, reel to reel and set it up on stage and record gigs for its own. And, and I, there's, there's very little recorded output by this outfit, but, but, the, but, but somehow the, the drummer got a good enough recording of this one particular, I think it was maybe on one night and, and some label put it out. There was a real popular band and, and, um, uh, uh, they were a, a, an excellent band and they, they put out some, somehow this drummer's home recording. I mean, his recording, he, ended up on vinyl. I don't even know when it was finally, when it was released at first, but a friend of mine gave me a, uh, made me a cassette of it about 25 years ago. And I, and I finally, and I wanted to download it or a digital copy. Uh, I actually uploaded the vinyl, but I, but I wanted a better copy. So I went to download a copy of it and they, it wasn't available for download. I had to buy a, they actually, by now they had put out a CD of it. So I just, I bought the CD, but it's, but it's, it's, it's a steel guitar and guitar. It's like a, <clears throat> it's like a country band, but these guys, th they play, they're so, they're so badass playing that, I mean, the, the, the people that, I mean, I can, I can picture the, the, the kind of honky tonk joint that this, w w where it was, it was just an old school dance hall beer joint where people dance in the middle of the club, I guess, you know, I don't know. I mean, I don't, I don't have any pictures of it, just a mental image of these guys. It's, it's, it's a live gig they're playing and these guys play so good. They kick ass so much on steel and on guitar and everything they sing and they do, they do jazz instrumentals and they, and they sing and they play and the, the songs are great. They play, they play some jazz standards and they, sing some jazz standards and they sing some country songs, but, but it's, it's really danceable. And, and the people that are there, I mean, I'm sure some of them probably appreciate the masterfulness of the, of the actual playing, but, but these people don't, I mean, a lot of people, they're just going there to dance and drink and have a good time. And there's some applause after those songs. But if I was there, I'd have been screaming until I was for <laughs> every song because it was, it was just the, it was, it was what it, what it was, was, badass jazz it, it was as good a jazz playing as you could as you could hear whether it was on steel or guitar hmm. but it was jazz with a country flavor that you could dance to and and i i don't know it's just it's ever since i heard ever since my friend made that, that vinyl copy of that it's been one of my favorite albums and uh and and the, and the miles that kind of blue that i don't i don't know i don't know it's possible to get tired of that and i've been listening to jimmy reed since i was about 14 and i still love it as much now as i always did i mean it's, it's hard to pick three but and, and that just turned out to be a, a jazz a blues and well i don't even know if you call jimmy reed blues but I, let's call it blues and and then the jimmy rivers i guess call it western swing so it I, I didn't even really look to put a different category for each three but that's the way it ended up cool but man. I, a lot longer list than that, as you know. Oh God, yeah. When you I, uh, when you played with um, when Merle, Mer so Merle was opening for you guys just to switch back for a well, second. Uh, I think he always played before we did. Who was his guitar player? Was it Red? No, that was uh, later on. He plays. 
he played some guitar, but I, I didn't, uh, Red wasn't on that show. And I actually, I can't even, he had a, he had a, a fiddle player and a, and a keyboard player. And I know he played some guitar. I'm sure he had a guitar player. I mean, this was in, this was in 05. So I actually, I actually don't remember. It was, mm. it was really good, but I, 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 I don't know the, the guitar. If he had a, he probably did have a guitar player and probably had a really good one, but I yeah. don't, I don't know who, I don't remember who it was. Did you ever bump into Red in Austin? Red? Oh yeah. Yeah. Really good guy. Really oh good yeah. Guy. Um, all right. Let's talk. Those are good selections, by the way. Thank you. Um, What's the most important things that you've learned about yourself throughout your whole career, man, and going through this, you know, up and down journey? Well, that's a hard one. I thought about that, and I, I don't really know that I know how to answer that. Uh, I, I I don't know. L- lately, I've – I think I mentioned – lately, I've been – examining my my just my whole life maybe more than I ever did and I kind of disappointed in some of the stuff I I see uh I'm trying to be more mindful of things and not so I mean I've always tried to be a a good guy and a nice guy and an honest guy I always tried to do that you know um but I I've been kind of I've been kind of shy and didn't maybe have confidence or um, wasn't quite ambitious enough or I, I don't know. I mean, I, I I feel like I dropped the ball and n- need a bunch of do overs, but, but it, to, to get, I don't really know exactly how to get very specific about that. I, 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 I don't know part of, just, just part of who I am, the way I, I mean, I'm, I'm grateful for the way I grew up because I had a stable family and everything, but I also, they, I I was, I was kind of, I'm kind of late at every, usually I get around to doing most things I want to do and learn, but I'm kind of slow and I, it takes, it takes me longer to get around to doing things and knowing things and realizing things just because my parents were kind of strict and I was kind of, held back and strict and slower than people that kind of a little sheltered. Yeah. 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 And, um, I mean, and that was, I don't know that I regret that except for the fact that when you have it rougher on, I mean, I, I'm really grateful that my whole childhood was totally secure and safe and warm and fuzzy, basically, you know, compared to a lot of people. You know, my parents didn't fight. They didn't drink. Nobody went to jail. Nobody got hurt. There was, mm. wasn't any kind of tragedy or tragic stuff, or traumatic stuff in my childhood. But 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 at the same time, people that grow up a little rougher, a little harder, might be a little bit more prepared for some things, you know. And uh, I, I was just sheltered. That was sheltered. That, that, that's uh, I think that. You know, being sheltered is is not a bad thing, but it can also delay certain things. Hmm. No, I it, totally get it, that. And it's, and I, uh, I mean, it's it's not really a bad thing, but in some ways, it kind of made things a little bit harder for me, maybe. Yeah. But uh, I don't know. I tried to be a good guy, and but but I I think I might have sh- should have had more confidence or maybe a little more ambition or, or, or something. I, I don't know. And, um, one thing I learned that, and it, and it goes all the way back to my first band in high school. It's like, I've been in situations where I didn't want to hurt somebody's. I mean, it wasn't, I, I rarely had my own band. I'm usually just a guy in a band. Mm. Sometimes more, more, uh, more of an influential member than other times. But, but sometimes I, have had to put up with, well, I don't know that that's the right way to put it, but I've played with people that maybe weren't as good as the rest of us. And I didn't want to hurt somebody's feelings, but I was going, man, I wish we had a different drummer. That's happened a few times. And if yeah. your drummer's weak, you, you don't, you, it's, uh, I mean, you don't want anybody that's weak, yeah. but I, I played with some weak players and I just didn't want to, 
rock the boat. But and 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 a lot of times in my early career, I I, I talked about how the I got delayed because of the, the military situation and all that kind of stuff. A lot of times I was thinking, oh, what the hell difference does it make? Because I can't pursue this on a serious level anyway. So I just want to go play some gigs and make some money. And this band's not perfect and it's not great. But if it was, I just have to lose it anyway. Because oh, of, you had that thing hanging over your head. Because of that thing. You know, if I... If, if that, if that hadn't been the case, I'm not really sure. I'm not really sure, you know, know how I would have proceeded with my life had I been more free to do what I wanted to when I wanted to do it. But that, I mean, you know, like I talked about it, just that 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 situation seemed to control my life for so long that I just I just felt like almost everything was out of my control anyway. So it, a lot of things just didn't even. Nothing even mattered that much what I was doing. Hmm. I totally get just that. had to do whatever I had to do to survive and get get by and try to figure out a way to get through all that. I totally understand that. I think a lot of people have stuff uh, like you know something that has dictated a a, a negative influence on their life, and it, it yeah. does paralyze you. Whether it's something from your childhood or something that you had to deal with, like in your case with the service, but something that you feel removed control from you and it's just hard to overcome that. Yeah. Uh, who, who's had the biggest influence on you, Denny, both musically and personally? Well, I, I was thinking about that too. And, um, I, I don't even know. I mean, maybe, maybe just my, the way I grew up, my family, just their values and the things that, I mean, I'm 74, but I still, I've talked about it with my sister. And sometimes we still think our parents are looking over our shoulder and seeing what we do. And we, we, it's, you know, we think, well, crap, you know, I wish I could get away, you know? And, and I, I, I don't know. I can't really think of any, there hadn't really been an older person or I, I can't really think of anybody in, in particular that's really influenced me so much. And what was the other one? It was musically or personally. Oh, musically, that that's almost impossible to say too. Uh, um, like I was saying, my first music was the first rock and roll. Uh, Little Richard, hitting, Chuck Berry, all, all Pat that Domino. kind of stuff, all mm. that stuff from fifty five and fifty six and fifty seven and. But but living in Dallas, uh, Dallas was a good blues town, really. I mean, maybe not on the uh, AM Top 40 white radio, but it, later at night. And the, there was definitely elements around Dallas that were aware of, of blues and loved blues. And well, even in, in Dallas, even our even girls in high school and squares knew who Bobby Blue Bland was and Ray Charles and Lightning Hopkins and Little Richard. And I mean, I mean, uh, John Lee Hooker and Jimmy Reed. Dallas was a Jimmy Reed town and uh, Lightning Hopkins and Freddie. And we, 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 I just, I, I learned about chess records and Excel records, uh, the, the blues labels and the blues guys just almost immediately after, after that other stuff. And, and I, I don't, I, I don't, I couldn't really, who had the most in influence on me? I don't. I don't know. I, I, I wouldn't know how to. I can't think of any 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 one person that, that musically that would that was uh, that I can't I can't really think of. I could think of maybe thirty. <laughs> most important thing your mom taught you, and most important thing you learned from your mom. Well, I was thinking about that too. Um, I don't know. She was just a. I don't know. She was just a very sweet, a very sweet woman. Everybody loved her. She wasn't all that educated. I mean, she certainly wasn't stupid, but she wasn't. My, my parents weren't educated and were all sophisticated and everything. But mother was just she was just a fine woman, just a good woman and a nice woman. And her mom and her sisters and everything were just nice, sweet women. And they just wanted everybody to be happy and be nice. And and I think I must have absorbed some of that because I noticed one thing about me that I don't know if it's good or bad, but like I, I'm too much of a touchy. I, t I just, 
when I like people or I, I just touch people, if I, lo- you know, if they're, yeah. and go, well, stop it, you know, but, but I, <laughs> but I just, when I really like somebody, I almost feel like I just, I mean, I, I, but when it comes to, to girls or women, I always make sure that when I do it, I do it in a very, um, uh, restrained, little, uh, non-threatening. Yeah, I get that. I, I, it, it's not lecherous when I do that. Right. I totally I, get it. I mean, I, I, I'm not that way. I don't, yeah. I don't, I don't do that, but I, but, but I've realized that, well, somebody, some people may not like for me to touch them like that. You know? <laughs> I mean, some people I know do, cause I have girls that come up to me to get their hugs, you know, but, but then lately I've just realized, well, golly, you know, I, maybe I'm just, to, I don't know. Maybe I need to tone it down, but I don't, I don't know. Mother, I don't know if, if she, I don't remember her sitting down and saying, okay, son, da, 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 you know, or my dad saying, okay, son, except my, I know that my dad didn't want me to be a lazy bum. He was always want me to get up and get out of bed and go pull some weeds or paint the redwood fence or go sand a car that he was getting ready to tape or just do anything. Just get out of the damn bed and, and go do some work. Is he it the most, guy he wanted they just, they just wanted me to be a decent person to pull my own weight and you know treat people good and and not be a lazy bum or, or something i guess is that the most important thing your dad taught you work ethic i guess so i guess so and i mean and if he if he thought i misbehaved or did you know i'm old enough to wear you know you'd get a whipping or or but it was worse for him because i could just I wasn't really all that scared of him, but he had the power and I was a kid. And if he wanted to ground me or make sure I pulled some extra weeds or something like that, I'd have to do what he said. And he, he just didn't want me to, to be a bad kid, you know, and, and it was, it was kind of rough. I think I had it rougher than a lot of other kids, but I mean, it wasn't that bad. I mean, he was still a nice man and I would, there was certainly never any abuse, but he just, he grew up in a small, both of my parents grew up in Waxahachie, Texas, very small, uh, little cozy, little North Texas town with small town values. And I mean, they were all really good people, nice people, but it was a pretty isolated, uh, conservative, uh, environment that my parents grew up in. And I think they might've been a little bit glad to get away from it, you know, because when you, I don't know, my parents left their hometown of Waxahachie and went to Hillsboro, Texas, down the road, I guess about the time, it seems like to me, like maybe about as soon as they could, but maybe they wanted to get away from some of that too. But still, all my relatives were just small town people with small town values, and they were all good people and just people laughing and I mean, I, I really like all my relatives. They're just happy, nice people. There's not many, there's hardly any left, but my dad came from a big family and I don't know. They just, my, my parents just wanted me to have their small town values. And, and the, and I guess what made it hard was, well, I was growing up in Dallas in the fifties and the sixties, you know, and it was a totally different world from what they grew up in. And it was, yeah, kind of hard to be that guy in that world that I was growing up in. Yeah. You know, I think Elvis Presley and little Richard scared them to death, you know? I mean, and that was just in the fifties and then compared to anything else. That's really, you can't get much tamer than that looking yeah. back, you know? But, no, totally. What's the toughest decision you've ever had to make or the hardest thing you've ever had to do? Well, that probably the first thing that pops into my mind was just going back to that, that military thing and how to deal with that situation of get, getting out of high school in 1962 and, and knowing that the draft is waiting to, 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 to get me. And that just seemed like such a scary traumatic. I mean, not, not scared in the sense that I was, I mean, there wasn't a, a war going on. I wasn't scared about, you know, going and getting blowed up. I just was, was going, okay, I'm finally out of high school. I get out of the house. What do I want to do? Go stay out all night and chase girls and play music? Or do I want to go to a boot camp? You know, and I knew I didn't, you know, and, and, but, but I couldn't, I didn't really have any options. Like I was saying, if, if, if I said, I'm just going to get a band and play, I would have, I would have gotten drafted within months and, yeah. and 
up in boot camp anyway. So I had there the, the options were go to school or join join one of the branches or get drafted or, or, or something. And that was a that was just a heavy decision to have to make. And and for me, none of the options were good. But, but it was it was a it was a real hard decision. Best advice you've ever been given and who gave it to you? Well, it might, I was thinking about that too. It, it, it might be, I think I'd already mentioned this, but you know, my dad and me, we had it kind of rough there after I started growing up and getting out of the house and trying to actually live as a musician and being broke all the time and everything. And, and he, he, we didn't get along at all. It was, it was very tense and it was mother had to suffer and it was a real drag and everything is a drag for me. And he was embarrassed by me, I think, and made me not like him. And uh, I think I was embarrassed by him and he was embarrassed by me and he didn't like me and I didn't like him. Blah, blah, blah. It was just a great big drag. And, and then this, this friend of mine comes over to my house and I'm telling him about the latest episode and, about my dad and and my friend goes hey man you need to yeah you gotta get that shit cleaned up or something like that you gotta get that cleaned up you gotta get that cleaned up and i was going huh but he's a big drag and he was going that don't matter you need to you need to get that cleaned up that's a good way to put it and um i don't know i i don't i don't really even recall getting that much at I don't know. I'm sure people have given me advice that I didn't want to hear throughout my life. But but I think that that might be the I mean, that was I would consider that advice. You yeah. Know? And, and that's really specific. And I I don't really know that I had advice that clear cut offered to me. I don't know maybe so I just can't remember but that I mean that was a big one that was a, that was probably as important as anything because I, after that happened I, I I eventually you know I started thinking about it and eventually I did my part to try to or I did my part to try to deal with that situation and try to smooth it smooth it over and I think that was really important so I'm grateful to my that was just a friend of mine you still in touch with this guy I hadn't seen him in a really long time. I, no, I, I'm not. Hmm. And man, I'm going to ask you the last question. I can't thank you enough. You've been so generous with your time and like so sincere. I really appreciate it. And I'm really glad that I had this conversation with you. What, what's been the biggest change in your personality, Denny, over the last 10 years, let's say, or even 15? And how much of this change has been deliberate and how much is just a natural part of aging? Well, I think that's the hardest question yet. And I, I'm sorry, but I don't really know. I don't really know how to answer that. Uh, I don't really know that I've, I don't really know that I've changed. I don't know if I've, I mean, I probably should have, but I, I don't really know. I don't really know that I have changed for a long time. Uh, I've been doing a lot of, maybe it's because I'm feeling older and stuff, but I, I look back on my life and I, I see a lot of mistakes that I've made, uh, situations. Maybe I blew some situations where I needed a do over and I'm not all that proud of, a lot of my behavior sometimes, but I mean, basically I, I think, I mean, I try to be a, a, a good person. I mean, I'm an honest person. I'm not a violent person. I, I like people and I like to get along with people and I like to, I like positive things. I mean, I'm, I'm flawed, of course. Uh, but I've just said and done stupid things that I can remember it. They're just popping into my head all the time. Oh yeah. What about that stupid ass thing you said or did? I mean, I wish I could stop thinking about them and have them pop in my head, but I, I've just, I mean, I've lived long enough to where I have made a lot of mistakes and I, I'm trying to, uh, be aware of them and not, and not, do that kind of stuff again, but I don't really know that I've 
You don't think you've changed at all in the last 10 or 15 years? Oh. You don't think you've changed much over the last 10 or 15 years? Uh, I don't, I don't think so. I mean, I, I don't know if I've changed that much. I mean, I've gotten, I don't know. You know, it's like ever since I moved here in 1970, you know, it's been real nice because, uh, by being a guitar player that never got married, never had kids, I've been able to maintain my uh, arrested development. (laughs) And uh, I still feel like I'm the, well, when I moved here in 1970, I was, came here ready to play. I wanted to play. I felt freedom. And I I was the first time I was starting to get this taste of freedom and, and and trying to shake off all these other obligations. And, And I, just wanted to play music, be in a band, play music that's, and live, live a life that was based around playing music and learning how to play it better. And, and I mean, I like girls, I like cars and I like music. And I mean, I like to read and try to be informed about stuff. And I, I, I have, I have other interests, you know, I'm interested in history and current events and stuff like that. But basically I'm just, I've just, I'm fortunate in that, I mean, it's, it's been a struggle, but I've just been a guitar player for a really long time. And I'm really happy that I've been one. I got really, really scared right, be, right before I got the Bob gig because things hadn't really ended up working out so good. And it's a great, it's, it's one thing to be broke when you're 25 or 30, but it's another thing to be broke when you're 60, you know, that's like, Oh, there's nothing. I mean, it, it was awful and scary and frightening and, and, um, uh, but, but other than, other than that, I don't know. I, I don't really see how I'm much different than I've always been. I hope I've got my stuff together a little better, you know, and I, I try to deal with things more responsibly, but I, I never was that bad about being irresponsible other than just being a, a guy that never got married and had kids and had obligations and stuff like that. But I don't really know that I changed any over the 15 years or gosh, even longer than that. Maybe I have, I hope I'm getting a little stronger and a little wiser, but sometimes I doubt that. (laughs) I'm sure you are. Maybe maybe I'm, I don't know that I've changed. I try to be wiser, but, but lately I'm thinking, golly, I never really thought I, I never really thought I was, I had any more than just average intelligence. I thought, well, I, at least I've got that. I think I'm, you know, I never really thought I was all that brilliant. I think I think I probably got at least average intelligence, but as time goes on, I'm going, well, I don't know. Maybe not. (laughs) Maybe I I don't have, maybe, maybe not. I don't know. Life's life's hard and, and um, it's hard and it's complex and I don't know. It's scary, but I mean, I'm real glad to, I'm happy and I'm real glad to be here and I probably should have changed a bunch of things, but I don't know that I really have. I can't really see anything that I've changed. I still like what I've ever liked. And I, you know, I don't know. Well, man, for whatever it's worth, I think, um, you're probably a guy who's hard on himself. And I think the world sees you in a different light than you might see yourself sometimes. So, um, for whatever that's worth. Well, it's worth something. Thanks. I appreciate it. And That'd I, be nice. I really appreciate uh, you coming on the show and sharing everything, man. Honestly, this is really nice and very kind of you. And um, um, I think a lot of people are going to enjoy this. And I want to tell people where they can get turned on to you. First of all, it's Denny Freeman, F-R-E-E-M-A-N. And check out his website. at It's DennyFreeman.com, correct? Yeah. Denny's got three standing gigs that he plays. And um, it's Tuesday night at Antone's from 6.30 to 8. These are, this is in Austin. So if you're in the Austin area or if you're in anywhere near and you want to go take a nice trip to see some great blues playing or some country playing, I'll, um, let me tell you what the gigs are. It's Tuesday. Every Tuesday night at Antone's from 6.30 to 8.30. Plays a great blues set. Uh, say hello to him and tell him you enjoyed listening to his interview. On Wednesday nights from 6 30 to 9 he plays at sea boys heart and soul and it's a country set and on friday night he plays at the 
Saxon Pub, which is pretty well known in Austin and plays a blues rock set. And that's at 6.30 to 8. And so go and, and check Denny out. And also go to his website. And he's got some CDs there of, of his for sale. Check him out and support his music. And um, if you bump into him, tell him he said, hey. Any uh, famous or final last words of wisdom? Well, no, I just really appreciate uh, the fact that you took the time to do this. I, I really appreciate it, and I enjoyed it. So, Thank you. Me too. I, I'm glad okay. I did it. Thanks again, man. I really do appreciate okay, it. Cool. Everybody, thank you so much for listening. I hope you enjoyed this interview as much as I did. Thanks again to Denny Freeman for spending time with us. Check him out online at DennyFreeman.com. And check him out Tuesdays, Wednesdays, and Fridays in Austin at Antone's, Seaboy's Heart and Soul, and at the Saxon Pub. Thanks again to Denny for coming here. I really appreciate it. Make sure you go to EveryoneLovesGuitar.com. Sign up to get on our newsletter list, and you can do that right now. And most important, remember that happiness is a choice, so choose wisely. Be nice, go play your guitar, and have some fun. Till next time, peace and love, everybody. I'm out. We hope you enjoyed this show. If you did, subscribe to the Everyone Loves Guitar podcast, and you can do this online at everyonelovesguitar.com or on iTunes. And if you like the show, please leave us a five-star positive review. The more five-star reviews we get, the higher our show ranks, and higher rankings mean we get to continue speaking with cool, interesting guests on our show. We'll see you on the next episode, and until then, keep playing your guitar and have fun making music.